What is women's economic empowerment? A woman is economically empowered when she has both the ability to advance and succeed economically and has the power to make and act on economic decisions. But today, women around the world remain underrepresented in the economy because of prevailing social and cultural barriers, especially as entrepreneurs. This is evident in the SME market segment, where registered women-owned enterprises only account for 37% of all businesses around the world. Entrepreneurial pursuits of women, particularly in the SME sector, remain constrained by access to capital. And while SMEs are typically under-resourced, women tend to start businesses with less capital than men do. Women have shown to outpace their male counterparts 1.5 times in terms of business expansion and growth. A robust SME sector creates opportunities by bringing business and jobs beyond the economic core. Thus, there is an increasing focus to grow the SME market for women-owned and women-led enterprises. More resources and investments are required to fuel this largely untapped market opportunity. Studies suggest that women tend to reinvest as much as two times more than men into their own enterprises, families, and communities providing a means for more sustainable growth and improving social outcomes for future generations. Economic empowerment for women increases women's access to and control over economic resources and opportunities, including jobs, financial services, property and other productive assets, skills development, market information and networks. Increase women's access to capital, business opportunities, and information. Enhance women's confidence and skills to be effective role models for change, allowing them to expand their networks, community involvement, developing decision-making and leadership roles as a result of women's entrepreneurial success. Investing in Women, an initiative of the Australian government, supports women leaders in the SME sector the economic backbone of developing countries. Investing in women also expands access to capital for women's SMEs through pioneering interventions with impact investors. Enable a better world. Invest in women today. To know more, please visit investinginwomen.asia. Women's SME Financing Gap Today, SMEs are key drivers of economic growth in most parts of the world, especially in the economies of East Asia and the Pacific. The region boasts a vibrant SME landscape with over 12.5 million in the formal economy and countless more coming from the informal sector. Because of their size, SMEs are starved for investments. Around the world, the SME sector remains largely unbanked and undercapitalized. In East Asia in the Pacific, an estimated 43% of SMEs are women-owned. Global trends show that women tend to start businesses with less capital than men. But despite having less capital, women startups outpace their male counterparts by a rate of 1.5 times. Women's SMEs also contribute to their communities by creating opportunities and multiplier effects in their localities. But alarmingly, an estimated 70.7% .7 of women-owned enterprises remain unserved or underserved by formal financial institutions. This creates a financing gap of at least 287 billion US dollars. In East Asia and the Pacific, this gender finance gap is estimated to be 68 billion US dollars. But why should these issues matter for impact investors? Studies show that economic growth becomes more robust and sustainable when both women and men are able to fully participate in the economy. 
Impact Investing has a role to play in achieving this goal. Through Impact Investing, the gender credit gap can be addressed to drive growth for women's SMEs. By promoting gender parity, income per capita can be boosted to as much as 12% by 2030. Increasing the GDP results to the creation of more valuable goods and services, improved standard of living, increased savings, and boost in purchasing power, job opportunities, and more people moving out of poverty. Women's SMEs cannot thrive unless they gain access to more financing options that include tailored products and services, flexible terms and conditions, and capital that captures their risk and return profiles. Investing in Women is an initiative by the Australian government that provides funding to impact investors. Investing in Women delivers interventions and promotes collaboration to move capital with a gender lens to and within Southeast Asia. Enable a better world. Invest in Women today. To know more, please visit investinginwomen.asia. Good morning, everyone. We hope you're all enjoying Philippine Startup Week. I am Marella from Cuba, and welcome to our Startup Pinay program. Um, we have an exciting event in store for everyone here. But first, let's quickly go back to how Startup Pinay first came to be. While the Philippines ranks the 16th most gender equal nation in the world, the tech industry is still very much male dominated. A 2017 study by Price, Waterhouse, and Coopers shows us that out of all the respondents, only 18% were female and 82% were male. So this is why Kubo created Startup Pinay, which aims to create and support a community of female-led and female-empowered startups through programs under our three core actions, which are exposure, network, and capacity building. These programs include sponsored participation in local and international conferences, as well as access to the media, community meetups, and mentorship. Collaboration is at the heart of what Kubo does. We would also like to take this moment to thank our partners for this program. The initial Startup Pinay programs were supported by the Department of Trade and Industry, and because of their support, we were able to send our Filipino founders to various international conferences in the last two years. This year, DTI is happy to announce another program that will support more female entrepreneurs called She Trades. So let's learn more about She Trades in this video. At ITC, we work to expand trade and investment opportunities for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. We set up the She Trades initiative to unleash the potential of women entrepreneurs because of the impact they can have on communities and on the economy. We want to connect 3 million women entrepreneurs to markets by 2021. Seven global actions help us achieve our goals. One, champion quality data. Two, enact fair policies. Three, secure government contracts. Four, strike business deals. Five, enable market access. Six, unlock financial services. And seven, grant ownership rights. We support a more inclusive trade ecosystem through policy advice, data, and dialogue. And countries are setting up their own She Trades hubs, focusing on the She Trades actions that matter most to them. Our online platform allows members to access learning materials, participate in live webinars with our partners, and do business. We also have a global reach through strong partnerships. Interested? Join us. Register on SheTrades.com and download the mobile app now. I run my own Shea business and I need a platform to help me make it grow. That's where SheTrades.com comes in. As a seller, not only can I sell my products, but I can find services and products on SheTrades.com. I can develop my skills through the SheTrades virtual learning and the SheTrades news, success stories and videos are so inspiring. Buyers and investors can also use the SheTrades platform to source services and products from women entrepreneurs like me. 
and as the verifiers, supporting women entrepreneurs such as chambers of commerce, business support organizations, and sheet rate partner institutions who can verify sellers, given us a stamp of approval displayed on our profile to give us more credibility. All users can also commit to one or all of the seven global actions to continue empowering women entrepreneurs together. Sheetrace.com is all about expanding your knowledge and your market to help your business reach new heights. Register on Sheetrace.com today and get the free mobile app available on Android and iOS. So this year, we've partnered with Investing in Women, which is an initiative of the Australian government that catalyzes inclusive economic growth through women's economic empowerment in Southeast Asia. We also have Manila Angel Investors Network, which is the largest committed private investors network in the Philippines. Before we begin, it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of the women leaders that we all look up to. In the past few weeks, we've seen how she was able to mobilize the resources of not only the government, but of the private sector as well. She has shown the importance of working together and being empathetic of others' experiences, which is something very important, especially during such trying times. Please help me welcome the Vice President of the Philippines, Lenny Berbredo, for the opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations to Butch Meili, President of Idea Space Foundation and Kubo Innovation Hub, and the rest of the team from Kubo for organizing Philippine Startup Week 2020. Congratulations as well to the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Department of Information and Communications Technology for teaming up with Kubo to make this event possible. Most of all, I tip my hat to all of this year's participants, in particular, the pioneering women who joined this year's Startup Pinay program. Thank you for breaking barriers and blazing trails in business and technology for other women to follow. The world around us has been transformed by COVID-19. Long-standing practices in education, business, and even the usual divisions between work and home life have changed. Technology has played a vital role in filling the gaps that have emerged, but gaps remain. In particular, challenges in infrastructure and restricted access to technology, which threaten the most vulnerable. If there is any lesson we can draw from this pandemic, it is that there is no better way through any crisis but together by collaborating to survive, to innovate, to adapt. In charting this shared path forward, our diversity in ideas, opinions, and contexts is one of our foremost advantages. As the long history of humanity has shown, it is when different voices come together in goodwill, when we engage each other, that the best ways forward are discovered. This is what events like this can do. They open pathways of cooperation among different industries and fields. More importantly, they remind us of how all our destinies are intertwined, how we all live under a single economic ecosystem, and how all of our available resources and skills, research from the academe, capital and technology from industry, adaptability from the youth, can be brought forward and directed towards the fruition of one goal, a better normal for all. So take advantage of this next few days, build stronger relationships with one another, share information and experience, and create opportunities for others to do the same. And remember that I and the rest of our team here at the OVP stand with all of you fellow believers in the power of collaborative innovation and science-based decision-making in pursuit of a fairer, more progressive, more humane nation. Thank you and congratulations. 
Thank you, VP Lenny, for that wonderful message. So now we'll be moving on to our panel discussion. Our first panel discussion revolves around an important question. Why invest in women? This segment invites female startup founders, investors, and venture capitalists to discuss the significance of enabling environments to promote women's economic empowerment in order to expand inclusive opportunities and shift attitudes to support women-led startups. We'll also be discussing the experiences of women when it comes to the funding process. So please help me welcome our moderator for this session, James Lett, Executive Director of the Manila Angel Investors Network, as he introduces our panelists. All right. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, um, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this panel today, we're going to discuss why invest in women in technology and startups. So my name to start with, I am James Lett. I'm the Executive Director of the Manila Angel Investors Network. Our main, we're an angel investors network in the Philippines, how we've um, established as a not-for-profit. So our mission is beyond connecting uh, investors with startups and working with startups to mentor them to get them investable. We also have a specific focus on uh, working uh, mindfully with a gender lens and we seek specifically to support more female founders and we have set up a catalytic fund to invest al alongside our members as Sidecar Fund and uh, we've committed to invest in as many founders as we can from uh, who are female. So I'd like to introduce to you to our fantastic panel today. Our first uh, participant is Mel Nava, who is the CEO and, and founder of One Expert, One Export. So thank you, Mel. Uh, next, we have uh, Rhea C, from, who's the co-founder of She Loves Tech. We also have uh, Timmy Dela Cruz, who's the Chief Investment Officer of Catalyst Ventures. Mm -hmm. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Ian Zhou, the associate of Panama Capital, and she's also an associate of Panama's Beacon Fund. So welcome, all of you. Thank you for joining us today. I think we'll um, have a very interesting conversation. But what I'd like to broadly do in, in the next 45 minutes to an hour, maybe a bit longer, I'd like to set out the case for investing in women to technology. I want to show what investors are missing out on by leaving money on the table. But more importantly, I want to better understand, I mean, we all know what the, the problem is or the challenge, but I want to know why it, you know, investment isn't happening equitably. Why are female founders getting less funding? And to do that, I'd like to touch on how can we address that situation and how can the people listening take away actionable insights that they can apply? Because, you know, as you know, we don't need more awareness, we need more action. So I'd like to try and have a discussion rather than a Q&A. So please jump in, feel free to ask each other questions, even ask me. But, you know, as an in introduction and, and to set the scene for us, I'd like to call on you each in turn to, from your perspective of investors, enablers and founders to tell us a bit about this these issues. But firstly, Timmy, Timmy, you've got a unique perspective. You've sat on both sides of the table. You've worked in banking, right. then in the startup scene at, at Medgrocer, and now you're an investor. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a bit about Catalyst and yourself and, and why you invest in female founders in the Philippines. All right. So Catalyst Ventures is a boutique venture capital firm based in the Philippines. We are stage and industry agnostic, although we do have a, a preference for impact investments. Um, the way I would describe our, you know, um, Thesis is that we are gender agnostic. Uh, we don't look at the founder's gender at all. In fact, like if you'd ask me, what do we look for in investments? I, I, you know, and without getting into too much detail, I'd say the top two factors would be one is the clarity of the vision. So where do you see the company going, and are you solving a real world problem? And second is the founding team. You know, the skill set. Again, regardless of gender, your level of commitment, ability to pivot, and um, your integrity, things like that. So um, for women, I think definitely it's important to inv to look at a lot of the women-led businesses um, for a whole lot of reasons. But I guess one of them is really, you know, you get perspective, you know, from women, you know, you get to identify problem, they get to identify problems and create solutions for problems unique 
to women. And at the end of the day, who gets funded impacts problems we get to solve. And you know, without looking at, without letting women effectively, you know, create problems, uh, so, create solutions for these problems, you tend to leave out half of the population, and that's just not good for business or society. I mean, we've seen this in. We've seen how you know in car safety or in even medicine dosing instructions how these are all biased towards men. So um, there def it's definitely important because of you know again you're leaving half of the population and we've seen a lot of studies on how women leaders um, create good returns and also there is that huge gap in terms of unmet real world problems. Thanks, Timmy. Um, and uh, Yen, Panama is well known as an impact investor, and you've now established the Beacon Fund. And that it's it's a little unusual in that it's focused on a different type of SME than is typical for a VC, and it's investing differently by debt products. But um, for those of you that don't know that are watching, would you briefly introduce yourself and and the fund in Panama and and tell us what you've been doing on on gender and why this issue is important to you setting up that fund. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, hi everyone. My name is Yen, and I'm uh, an associate at Beacon Fund. So, Beacon Fund was seeded by Panama Capital. We are, um, uh, which is a regional VC fund that focuses on social impact impact businesses. Um, and uh, just for the past few months, uh, we established the Beacon Fund to focus mainly on serving women entrepreneurs. Uh, the reason why we set up this dedicated fund uh, is because uh, after working for more than two years in the gender lens investing space, we realized that um, there are a lot of female entrepreneurs uh, whose businesses don't fit with the growth profile of VCs um, because you know when they they set out to build their businesses, they um, mainly target the business model that are very sustainable, very cash flow uh, sustainable, and try to uh, aim at making profit since the very beginning, instead of, um, you know, uh, like tech startup companies that mainly strive to, to grow and don't care that much about making profit yet. Um, and so, so that's one reason. Uh, that makes these businesses struggle to raise uh, money from especially private investors, um, private, uh, as in private um, market investors, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so we, we think that um, there should be better products to serve these businesses that, uh, you know, don't have to be a unicorn to be a good business because um, unicorn is not the only way to to be successful or to make the business worth mm. your investment. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's that's actually the echo of Beacon Fund. So making or providing different products that serve um, woman-led uh, businesses. And the first product that we bring to the market is a debt product uh, because, uh, like I mentioned before. A lot of these businesses, they don't have, um, um, you know, they don't have very exponential growth. However, they have very sustainable cash flow, and uh, a lot of time they have profitability already. So that uh, we think could be a better suit for them um, uh, with, uh, yeah, with investment. Mm, Along the way, you we will, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be very um, interesting to see how how you go because it, it is a, a a different approach to the the standard approach for the industry. So it's uh it could be very disruptive and show a new way forward. So it'd be very interesting to see how it goes. Um, and next at the panel we have Raya. Raya, you with She Loves Tech, one of the the founders of that. You're an enabler, and I'd love to hear more about you know the work you're doing to promote and support female founders. But you know also you've supported hundreds of female founders through your programs and you've probably seen you know across 
numerous geographies what the common barriers are that female founders are facing in their funding journey. Love you to share some of your insights from that. Yes, uh, thank you, James, and hello, everyone. My name is Ria, and I am the co-founder of She Loves Tech. Uh, she Loves Tech is the world's largest startup competition for women in technology. We started in 2015, and to this date, we're the world's largest and covering you know 30 plus countries. This year alone, we did 40 plus rounds. Um, it's the first time doing it virtually, but you know we were able to do this competition or bring this competition across you know six continents. Um, so far, we have. I would say had 5,000 startups right throughout the years of join our program, and among the alumni startups, you know they have managed to raise 150 uh, million US dollars right in total in aggregate. Uh, at the same time, uh, this year actually at this time of uh, well at, at the time of showing this video, we're actually uh, past weekend. Um, well, Tomorrow, 21st and 22nd, we are actually going to be wrapping up our series this year um, with you know a massive global conference, uh, which will be showcasing you know our top 12 uh, startups that we've selected across all of these regions this year. Um, and you know that being said, I think echoing you know what had been said earlier, right? Um, the the mission of our organization is really you know to accelerate startups with a gender lens and to unlock one billion worth of capital over the next five years, precisely because of our topic, right? Um, why why do we want to get more investors to invest in women uh well firstly as you know timmy echoing what timmy said right um in terms of ideas uh you know women compose half of the world's population and with just by sheer fact alone without even looking at any other statistics you know we are going to be missing out on 50 percent of the world's ideas right if we don't incorporate women and in an industry as important as technology we're all going to be put at disadvantage right especially if you add on more statistics as to what type of businesses women tend to create right women especially during this time of covid has you know showcased exemplary um you know uh, uh examples of basically uh, startups who have managed to not just thrive during this time, not just survive rather, but thrive and really create businesses that solve a lot of our core needs. So imagine if you know we are not investing in these women, we are not investing in these businesses that can actually solve our greatest challenges, right? We are all put at a disadvantage. Unfortunately, the investment community um, still a lot, has a lot of a systemic bias, right? Although it's not implicit bias, um, increasingly more and more people are getting aware. Um, you know, there's a lot of women tech movements. Um, there's also a lot of movements to encourage more investors to support, you know, women. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of system systemic bias, right? Um, a lot of the times we look at the entrepreneur community, um, but actually the investment community as well, right? There's a, there's, there's a low amount of partners, low amount of investors that are actually women, right? And, you know, thinking about a lot of like unconscious bias and, and all of that, of course, by, 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 I would say sheer habit, right? And some, uh, some some patterns that they have observed over the years, they would tend to invest in women first and foremost. And then you add on the fact that you know a lot of the the funds were created with that traditional uh, structure where a lot of their um, I would say investment practices or criteria are all shaped uh, or rather molded by successful case studies that maybe men you know founders have done. And so this significantly affects the chances of you know uh, of of women getting funding from them. And there are actually like, you know, a lot of, I would say, like case studies over the years as well, in terms of when, you know, women are pitching in front of VCs um, compared to when men are, you know, pitching in front of VCs. And we would start to notice uh, differences in terms of how VCs approach, uh, whether it's due diligence or even just like the basic questions, right? Um, it, it's commonly seen that, you know, VCs would tend to ask questions about the future when it comes to like the men, whereas when it comes to the women, they would tend to look at more of track record, right? Which I think is very, very important. But the fact that, you know, you look, you overlook um, these questions or some of these concerns with men, and then, you know, focus on all of these things with women, 
um, and coupled, and then again, like coupled with the fact that women tend to, you know, in, in their, you know, pitching, maybe, you know, they, they have certain habits to um, under pitch, right? You know, whereas men over pitch, yeah. then that even aggravates the gap, right, further. So mm. there are a lot of these like, systemic bias on both sides, I would say, and then coupled with certain habits and like, practices that women uh, tend to have as well, um, you know, all, all of these, I would say, comp compounded, right, um, basically affects the fact that around the world, there's only 2% VC investment that goes into women. So I think uh, this is, you know, a, a really crucial, I would say, uh, issue that everyone uh, needs to really focus on. And I hope that, you know, today we can talk a little bit more about how we could, you know, enable more investment go to women. Yeah, that's, I mean, you touched on, on so much there, Ray, that I want to, you know, drill down to into this this chat like pipeline issues, implicit bias. You know, the the practices, the way that this the investment industry has been structured. How is how are they systemically and structurally proving a barrier? So it's a great mm -hmm. sort of overview. So, but Mel, I'd like to turn to you now as as the founder on the panel. You're the founder of One Export. So I'd love to hear about your work, but also, and we can dig into this in each of these. I'm sure you've got exactly what's happened to you but i'd love to hear about your experience on the funding trail okay so hi um everyone uh, and thanks james um well yes i'm the founder of one export i'm mel nava and we basically started one export in 2017. now um, i think the reason why i'm on this panel is um well I, i'd want to bring up a bootstrapping perspective because of course bootstrapping is still a way of funding right yeah. especially for women who cannot um, get funding immediately from VCs or from um, investment firms, right? One way to be able to make sure that your businesses thrive is to survive, right? And so bootstrapping, I, I am, I am we, we, we still are bootstrapped. It's been um, roughly uh, three years since we've been, um, we, we've been actively racing um, around actually in 2020 and we all know what happened, uh, the pandemic happened. So a lot of the VCs decided to not invest immediately and to be able to mitigate those risks. However, um, what we've learned over the past few years was, you know, um, because we are um, innately a very bootstrap company, we became very um, creative with our funding. So, for example, when we had orders abroad that we needed to fulfill, um, we crowdfunded for these orders and we were able to, you know, we were able to get um, money that grew our sales, right? Um, the other creative things we've also been able to do um, as part of funding and financing and investment would be um, to ask payment upfront from our customers. So we, we were outright um, up honest with them and we said, you know, we need to be able to manage our working capital and we need to be able to pay salaries. Would it be possible for you to um, pay us upfront and in return, we will give you value. So we will make sure that you, your orders are processed much faster, right? Um, and of course, the other things that we did um, to be able to uh, really survive this pandemic and, and race on our own, um, despite not having a VC or an investment firm back us up, is really to make sure that our cash flows and our margins are well managed so that we can really operate and, and turn over a lot of our cash. So, um, of course, it's important uh, for investors to um, to to invest in women. I believe that very strongly, but in the time where it's a pandemic, um, making it very difficult for women to get more investment because everybody is just trying to get investment at this time to survive. It is important to survive on your own um, by making sure that you grow sustainably. So I guess th those are things that I really advocate. And um, I believe, um, you know, what, when we took on this strategy, we said, um, you know, initially in, in Q1, we said we were going to raise funds. But when the pandemic hit and we knew that the markets were going to be um, vulnerable or um, ambiguous by March, we took a strategy on growth and sustainability. We said we were going to scale back on investment. And by taking on this strategy, we in fact grew this pandemic. And actually, we are hitting our first quarter of um, positive um, net profits. So we are very proud um, that we've taken on this strategy. Um, and this is without funding. We, we've taken um, great creative ways. And you know, we, we're very proud of what we've been able to achieve so far. Congratulations, Mel. I mean, you're positioning yourself well for when we do get through what we're facing at the moment, positioning yourself well to grow and scale and, 
and catalyze it. So it's great to hear. I mean, what we heard, we, it, there's no one's in any doubt of what the problem we're, we're facing is. And we all know that, you know, wind farmers are getting less funding. We, we know that there's this growing body of evidence that links gender and other forms of adversity with, with better and improved financial performance. You know, some studies that I've seen suggest that women founded business deliver twice as much per dollar invested than those founded by men. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's there, but regardless, we've still got this situation. So what I would ask is, is Raya, do you think, you know, do we still need to help investors see the business case? Or is everyone on the same page yet? Do we need, is it more about implicit bias and structural things or do we still need to convince the investors? I think um, this is actually a very interesting question, um, especially for me, just because I feel like we have uh, sort of like grown along with this journey of, you know, creating more awareness, right, for women and like investment. So when we first started in 2015, right, um, that was our very first time doing this competition. We only did it in one country at that time. Um, and it was all purely also because, you know, we were running a different organization at that time that was, you know, helping professional women's growth and development and so on. And it, yeah, eventually transition to what we're doing right now. At that time, when we first did that competition, it was really, we were one of the first, if not the first, right, to ever create a competition like this, uh, to really uh, put, you know, women in tech on, on the map, so to speak, right? Um, but, you know, luckily, we did get a lot of, I would say, support uh, from a lot of leading individuals at that time and organizations. But at the same time, there was a lot of feedback, right? Um, you know, after the competition in terms of the quality of the startups, in terms of, you know, a lot of, I would say, traditional more like biased comments, right? Like, like oh yeah, women uh, tend to just create businesses that are like lifestyle based or, you know, e-commerce, um, not really worth investing in. You know, there's a lot of, I would say, not necessarily negative comments, but I would say a lot of biased comments, right? These are a lot of like assumptions. Now, fast forward, I would say like, two years, three years, and now like on our sixth year, I would say, um, you know, we hear less of these things. In fact, I think um, our competition or our, you know, cohort is actually a perfect example of um, the awareness being present already, right? So because nowadays we don't really need to sort of educate everyone on why, you know, there's a need to invest in women, right? Um, there's less talk about what kind of technologies they are creating. You know, a lot of the supporters, you know, we work with a lot of funds from all over the world, not just, you know, gender lens funds, not just impact funds. And they all like support us and they all come to the competition because they're looking at pipeline. They're looking at good pipeline period. Um, and so that is, I would say a good, um, you know, example and a good sort of like case study, right? But at the same time, I think that um, there's definitely a lot of work left, right? So I think maybe less about awareness, um, but definitely I think that there's still, you know, room for showing more good case studies, right? Just to show them, hey, okay, I've, I've read the numbers, I kind of see it. But again, like I said, there's a lot of unconscious bias that are still there, yeah. um, that are still inherent, right? So you need to kind of just push a lot of these examples in front of their faces for them to gradually just like, change as well, right? The, the way that they're thinking. And more importantly, I think there's a bit of, um, I, I would say, advocacy that's needed on the fun, fun side in terms of, you know, maybe uh, how they can maybe restructure some of their um, personnel, right? Maybe they can improve, uh, increase the number of women participation on that side, because that definitely helps, right? I think that um, definitely diversity, right? not just gender, any form of diversity is always important to make a very balanced decision. Um, imagine if all of your maybe analysts are all male, fresh grad from whatever top universities, they will be thinking a certain way, right? And then by the time they filter it all the way to the decision makers, you will be left with only a small portion of, you know, selectable like startups. And then in terms of, you know, the higher ups as well, there's a lot of, um, I would say investment goes into um, uh, referrals, right? But if a lot of the people around them are going to be also male partners, male VCs, then you could also, you know, imagine what kind of uh, startups they would usually uh, come encounter, right? So even if we take away, um, you know, awareness or lack of interest, right? I think there is still that, um, yeah, advocacy and, and more case studies that need to be uh, add, added to mix as well as, you know, just increasing more women on the investment side, I would say. Yeah, no, I think, you know, we main, we do, uh, at the moment we're doing a lot of education and, and case studies is something we're constantly seeking to help bolster that case. But Timmy, you were nodding your head there. Would you like to add something there? You sound like you really yeah, want to okay, jump so in. Yeah, okay, so definitely agree. Um, with the unconscious bias, you know, people 
invest in what they know. If and if you don't have females in the funding team, then that would definitely be a problem. Um, you know, knowing that there is unconscious bias, how do you then control for that? Because if you remember, a lot of men think they are not sexist, but when you look at the statistics, you know, they're actually a lot of them are thinking of it the wrong way. Um, so what we do in Catalyst is we try to be as objective as possible by placing controls. You know, like I th some things I would um, suggest is with your with the set of questions you have, make it standard across the board, regardless of who you're talking to. Um, another one is, you know, there are a lot of resources online. You know, one I suggest is looking at Wharton University's Project Sage 3.0 um, toolkit. So because of since we read that, for example, we're starting to um, ask our investees to implement uh, what do you call this a diversity and inclusion policy in their startups as well. Um, another example I would th say is um, make it a rule not to ask se sexist questions, you know, um, and maybe have a woman look at it because some of, sometimes we are not that that self aware, right? So yeah, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, Mel, you had a little chuckle there with sexist questions, so I'm sure you've experienced that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, you know, be, uh, facing a lot of um, uh, um, investment firms, I have been asked um, if I have a boyfriend, oh. uh, when do I plan to get married, do I, have to, do I plan to have kids? So these are questions, I understand that team is a, is a critical part of running a startup, but these are questions that would have never been asked if, if I were a man, mm -hmm. right? So these are questions that come into play mostly because I'm a woman. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you try to not take offense. I understand um, the perspective of VCs, but you also take into account the, the, that there is, a, there is a real bias with um, these questions, right? Because, um, you know, what, why can't I say, say I, I had a kid? Uh, for example, or if I was married, what makes me different from running it uh, versus a single woman, right? I mean, I mean, I, ideally, it, it should be innately like results driven, right? And it's just really hard for women, um, uh, especially just looking at you know other ma other male um, co uh, founders who um, other male founders in the startup scene that get money much faster because they don't get asked these questions, right? So these are things that you know we constantly deal with. Of course, we work with them by really showing that we can provide results, deliver results, have traction, have a good um, uh, have have a good um, uh, basis or or backup. You know things that will help us back up our claims. But it's not again as as echoing what Rhea mentioned a while, a while ago. Um, you know, um, if you ask men, you ask about future plans, right? Um, but with women, you always have to ask about track record, right? And then you question a lot about those future plans. And so, um, uh, again, awareness is important, but also making sure that, you know, there are more women founders that succeed in this space. That way, you know, the playing field becomes much more leveled, right? There, I, 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 I understand the bias because there are very few women founders that succeed. And um, it's mostly the male founders that get so much attention and highlight um, when it comes to startup success. But if you have more female founders that can succeed and lead the way, then eventually this bias will not exist anymore. And that's what we try to achieve as founders. Mm. So the, the, the bar is, is much, much higher. I mean, I wanna, what I'd like to do for the rest of some of this, um, this webinar, this panel is to break down each of these issues in turn that you've all, all raise and explore why it's happening and I'd like to probably the first thing I'd like to, to talk about is you know is it the way that the indus industry is structured and evaluates investors and what we're talking about here is is the networking process and the pitching process you know you've touched on that each of you through your, your um, through your answers so far but what I'd like to ask is is Yen we know, you know, we know Panama is very switched on with the Beacon Fund, but you must have had experiences with potential co-investors in around who have shown this explicit or implicit rather bias. And, you know, 
was it in your experience? Is it the way these diligence questions are being phrased? Is it the way the pitches are run? Um, I, you know, I'd love to learn from your experience in, in identifying those challenges and, and what your thoughts are on how we can address them. Yeah, I think um, for me specifically coming from both the VC background and also now working more in uh, mainly general lens investing in the form of Beacon Fund. Um, I can share that, yes, from my experience working in the VC uh, network. Um, a lot of the events or a lot of the pitching competition have been, uh, you know, set up in a way that uh, put women in uh, disadvantaged, um, you know, position to 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 pitch their company because, um, yeah, a lot, of, as we all know already, a lot of those competition they, um, you know, they there are certain jargons that um, are more, you know, used to. Um, um, that male founders usually use, and also um, investors are looking to hear from. So um, I can see a lot of bias in the way that um, you know both um, male founder uh, doing their pitches, and also the investors looking for in those pitches. So that is one. Um, the second thing is. Uh, uh, yes, the question to what um, um, male and female in entrepreneurs are quite different. Uh, as most of the panelists today have pointed out, um, female founders are usually asked uh, downward oriented questions. So asking more about risks and um, you know, downside scenarios. Whereas uh, for male entrepreneurs, they are asked more about vision, about ideals, and about market potentials. Um, so even within our fund, um, we have to do a lot of internal catch-up sessions where we share our own experiences um, working with uh, entrepreneurs so that the team members can uh, hear and potentially point out if we have any unconscious bias uh, with the way that we do our work. Um, because, uh, yeah, we have encountered our own internal uh, unconscious biases. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the way that we keep ourselves uh, checked. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I might there I might get Cubo to throw some links up, but I was um, listening to another webinar recently, um, and there's actually tools online that um, some of the universities have developed that you can sit a test online and it will help you identify your implicit biases through science and, and algorithm and things. Uh, so it's very fascinating. I'll get um, Cubo and Ross to throw that up. But um, I mean, Raya, you see a lot of pictures, as you said, from numerous countries. You've, you've touched on a lot of points, but you know, is there a better way to do pictures and to run this investment process? Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think, you know, uh, that, that's a very loaded question, I think, right? <laughs> regardless of woman or, or men, I think, like, what's the best way to pitch? I feel, you know, that will require an entire mentorship session, I feel, or whatever workshop. Um, that being said, perhaps I can answer your question with some commonly um, sort of like observe uh, Please. issues yeah. or, or, or just like little things that observe, right? Um, so at the years in regards to, you know, maybe how female founders uh, pitch compared to how male founders pitch. Um, I think, you know, the, the first thing is, you know, what I already touched upon earlier, right? I think um, for the most part, like, we try to say that, you know, men and women are actually, you know, there's not much difference, right? Um, and, and, you know, as entrepreneurs, they face the same issues and so on. But frankly, we have also observed that, again, male and females uh, tend to pitch differently, right? And this is caused by, probably the environment that, you know, uh, that, that we all grew up in, how we were molded, you know, gender bias and so on. And that being said, you know, male tend to, I get over pitch, right? So they tend to just like, you know, pitch like in a, in a very confident, right? And very big way, right? Which, uh, again, coupled with any like systemic bias would make them look even better, right? Um, first and foremost. And then when it comes to women, they're a little bit more low key, right? Um, you know, first of all, they tend to want to make things perfect, 
right? So they wait a long time. So they already, there's a lead time that's being lost, right? Um, there's an opportunity that's being missed. Um, and then when they pitch, right, it's, it's I would say, a little bit more um, uh, underrated or, or they try to just really... Um, not pitch over overtly or you know they don't want to overly calculate things um overestimate they want to be safe right so there's that lack of risk um that may sometimes affect the way that they are perceived by you know the predominantly like male vcs right so i would say that's one thing now um the second thing is um not necessarily about a pitch necessarily but one of the main things that we notice as well like common issue that we've seen with a lot of the founders uh despite the geography is the positioning, right? Sometimes like just a change in positioning of their business would, you know, change the entire uh, way that they are perceived, right? Whether it's like in a full page, elevated pitch or whatever, but the way that they are positioning sometimes their business um, sometimes affects, you know, the success rate of being invested in it. So we've had, you know, many case studies or many examples in our cohort where, you know, we would adv advise some of just, you know, changes in the way that they would position the business and how they pitch um, and, you know, automatically they get funding, right? Whereas, you know, they didn't really change any part of the business, right? It's just a matter of, you know, forming certain things and how they, um, yeah, do their one-liner or, you know, how, how they want uh, other people to perceive their business, right? Um, and then I would say uh, the, la the last thing, uh, um, if I were to add like one more point, um, I would say it's less about pitching, but rather uh, just, you know, uh, a lot of like commonly see, seen issues, right? So again, because there's a lack of network, um, you know, they don't really know where to pitch. There's that lack of confidence. And so, you know, they don't tend to pitch to as many investors. Um, you know, they also lack that you know, information and support in terms of, you know, what they need to do when they're facing with investors. They don't really know, you know, what the investors are thinking as well. So sometimes that affects like the way that they craft their pitches. Um, and also, you know, that lack of practice, right? Like, so, so there is a lot of, um, I would say like preparation issues, um, so to speak. Um, yeah, so I would say like those are the top things, but you know, going mm -hmm. into detail would require like a longer time, I would say. <laughs> Kibo might get you back to talk about that. That, that, ties neatly into my next question I was going to direct at, at Timmy as an investor. So, you know, network is important. If you keep yeah. seeing, you know, if you're a, a white middle class male, you're going to keep with certain networks, you're going to keep seeing the same type of founder. So how, you know, how important, I'm probably answering the question myself, but how as an investor do you step outside your existing network for, when looking for diverse founders and, and what strategies can you build in as an investor to, to ensure you have that robust pipeline of, of women and, and diverse founders to back? Okay, so it's kind of a balance of both expanding your network but also keeping it, um, filtering it out. So you, you, you um, work with people who are already like-minded who basically share the same values um so anyway going back to how we expose ourselves um we we make sure we go to a lot of public you know events um definitely it's a continuous um work in progress we always you know we, we follow multiple accelerators and other institutions involved in the ecosystem and make sure you know we basically don't say no to a first meeting, you know. <laughs> you really just give everyone a chance to give everyone a chance. Um, this, so that's actually one of my advice to um, aspiring startups or startup leaders is that you know take advantage of how the system, uh, the ecosystem is full of people who are open to conversations. Um, women especially are not used to networking. Um, part of it is because you know we're not really. Um, used to building ourselves up. So I, I always tell them to just drop the humility and advocate for yourself. Um, when Rhea was mentioning how women tend to underpitch, it's funny because I remembered how I observed the same thing, but not in pitches, but during interviews. Like when I'm interviewing someone for a yeah. job, it's very different between men and women. And, you know, this whole time we've given a lot of examples of systemic issues, but we have to remember that gender bias is also very internalized meaning women have to check themselves you know i suggest googling how humility hurts women so um yeah i don't normally give a whole lot of um advice when it comes to pitching but definitely i think women would gain a lot by you know just having more conviction or confidence when they speak um yeah. 
uh, as much as I wouldn't want to feed into the bias, but you know, there's an article in HBR Review where the author says, um, the uneven management sex ratio is partly due to our inability to discern between confidence and competence. And you know, a lot of men naturally exude that. And you know, as much as you know, you wouldn't want to keep adjusting, it's just one of the realities while we're trying to fix the bigger problem. Mm, mm. And it's you know, it, in interviews, for instance, it's I know that that some women they say we did this when they actually did it, whereas men they didn't do it, but they say I did this, even though it's a team thing. So it's 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 that sort of phrasing, yeah. So. Um, Touching on this, and one of the things that, that has been, you know, I've been thinking about quite a lot lately, and I, I don't know the answer, so that's why I'm going to throw it to your group. But, you know, leaving aside the market impacts of COVID and the situation that we're seeing now, has, you know, moving on to Zoom and online communications where, you know, it's, you know, you judge people, they say you judge people within the first five seconds of meeting them and walking in a room. But, you know, Moving on to Zoom, has that made it easier or harder for women founders to raise relative to men? And I'd like to firstly ask Mel. I mean, Mel, have have you found it different in any way, pitching and, and talking to investors? Well, um, I think, well, of course, uh, just not having the face-to-face -face interaction has been a little bit difficult in terms of getting investment. But again, it is a numbers game. Um, so uh, as much as possible, um, you try to, again, get connected. So ask people to introduce you, right? Be very more, be very open about, you know, we're here, we're investing right now. Are there people that you could refer us to, right? Um, we actually have this thing where we have to send at least 10 people um, cold emails every day right no matter whether, whether or not we know them so we're a little more aggressive now in terms of our fundraising strategy whereas i agree before we were a little more timid like okay we're not sure if we're going to get investment we're not sure if we're going to survive this pandemic we don't want to waste anybody's money but now that we've been able to gain confidence in our business model especially in this pandemic you know we're, we're out there just really asking people for 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 their trust and confidence in our company so I guess it's one thing to really build confidence in women um, in terms of investing. But I also feel like it's another thing to really trust women and their businesses. Um, as mentioned um, by Yen for the Beacon Fund, right? Some businesses of women are not tech. They're not scalable. So they're not in the current portfolio of VCs. But they work, right? If they have an accessory business or a clothing business that is making money in the pandemic, try to invest in these women because if they've survived a pandemic, they will survive other things, right? So I think it's really um, building confidence. Women trying to get more confidence in this in this time, especially of, in the pandemic um, and after the pandemic. But also, um, I think we need investors really look at, you know, traditional businesses, you know, as, as a business, they're not not just you know just because it does not scale or it's not in tech, right? Or they have very little tech applications. These businesses are still businesses, and these businesses, if they are able to survive a pandemic, um, will be good for an investor's portfolio, right? So so it's something that um, people need to be able to look at, right? I mean, we need a lot of these businesses to survive, especially in the pandemic. For example, food businesses to survive in the pandemic, right? restaurant businesses to survive in the pandemic and if there are no investors that will invest in them then how do we expect a, a, a whole economy to survive so i think i think it's the other the other appeal would be that right um aside from of course women having confidence women um being more aggressive um in terms of fundraising it's also trust in women trust in these businesses because we need you guys to survive mm, exactly Thank you, Mel. Um, what I'd like to do is now is, is move on to, um, you know, one of the excuses, we'll call it that rather than a reason that you, you hear for a, a lack of investment into women is that, you know, they claim there's a lack of investable women startups, a lack of pipeline. So, yeah. I mean, Yen, what's your experience with the pipeline? Is it really a pipeline problem or is it is it something else? Um, yeah, so I will add my perspective in, uh, in 
you know, most of the mandate, the VC mandate, and then the debt, private debt mandate, right? So for the VC equity mandate, uh, I would say that the lack of uh, the lack of uh, pipeline is there. Um, uh, it, it is because the I mean, like of all of the reasons that we have mentioned in this uh, panel so far, um, then there are not a lot of women-led businesses uh, or women-led startups um, that are scalable at the um, at the profile that we see typically require in order to invest in. I would say um, so. I I don't think. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think this is the problem of, of female entrepreneurs, but it is a systematic problem that, you know, like uh, prevents them from building um, a scalable businesses because they don't have access to, you know, um, say mentoring or networking of investors or funding, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's from the VC perspective. In terms of the, um, you know, like, that perspective, um, I, I I don't think pipeline is an issue because um, there are a lot of um, you know moderate growth and cash flow positive businesses out there. Um, that yeah, that we need to do a better job. Um, you know, getting in touch with them um, mm. and so building yeah. out your networks and that's right. Yeah, mm. having been in the in the market for that private debt for only a few months, but we have seen quite healthy pipeline. And um, yeah, I, I think we just need to have better efforts to tap into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, would anyone else, I mean, we'd like to have a discussion. Anyone else wants to jump in on that, that question? Uh, yeah, I'd like to jump in on this. Um, you know, when I look at these numbers about, you know, how, or stats about how women are struggling to secure funding, part of me is always wondering, you know, in the Philippine context, um, when you say they're having a hard time getting funding, you know, how much of this is because there are less of them in the first place? Um, you know, in Catalyst, it's a bit of a pipeline problem. It's not glaring. It's not a huge gap. But there definitely are a little less women entrepreneurs. And... For me, and I'm going to pull this way back and say I think it's partly, you know, personally, I think it's a cultural problem because, you know, statistically, we have much less women in the workplace than men. And then among those, even less took, you know, uh, science, technology, engineering, math courses, which in the um, typical definition of a startup, it's usually a tech company. And, you know, when you look at our data in the Philippines, you know, like uh, I think it was looking at the 2017 shed data. Um, when it comes to engineering and technology, the enrollees are only 29% women. When you look at IT, it's it's improving. It's 40%, but it's still pretty low. And you know, we look at what courses women are going for. It's typically teaching, nursing, and it's not really, you know, for me, it's not really surprising because of how we are raised. You know, I think in the Philippines, the gender roles, the stereotypical gender roles are still very much ingrained. And you can see this maybe in the types of toys we're given, you know, like how girls are, girls are given dolls and kitchen sets and we do more household chores statistically. So, you know, it's really a ch from childhood, you're kind of um, conditioned to be that way. And similarly, uh, we're told more often to, you know, to smile more, to basically we're conditioned to people please more, which is you know, again, leads into how confident we are when we get into the business world, which is pretty cutthroat. So, I mean, that's just one perspective. Obviously, it's a lot of factors, but that was one thing I I was thinking about. Mm, I see a lot of nodding heads on, on the panel, what you've been saying to me. I mean, Mel, you look like you want to jump in there? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I agree with what Timmy said, um, but I also want to add that Again, we need more women entrepreneurs on the ground uh, because, again, most people think that uh, women cannot scale their businesses or cannot grow their businesses when, in fact, they can. Um, I, I also believe it is important to be able to create an ecosystem where women support other women, right? So, for example, in the Philippines, there's actually a, a chat group for startup women um, uh, founders so that if they need to ask questions on fundraising or if they want to ask um, other, you know, um, other term sheets, uh, term sheet formats, or um, 
is this valuation acceptable? Is this fine? Right? They can easily ask from other founders who have raised. So I think that's a good initiative um, by Startup Pinay, uh, where they really create a uh, an ecosystem where um, startup founders can talk, you know, meet on, in online events or meet in offline events, for example. And um, for example, Startup Pinay, um, which is also uh, um, advocated by uh, Kubo, which is an accelerator in the Philippines, really make sure that um, women have um, a chance to invest to get uh, VC funding through competitions. Right, they sponsor. They help us get sponsorship for competitions or pitching, pitching events to VC. So I think that kind of ecosystem is important. But also, I'd like to point out that you know um, there has to be more encouragement um, for uh, women to start their startup. And one way to do that is to really make sure that women succeed in the startups that they are at, and having a really good ecosystem to be able to back them up. Mm, mm, thanks, Mel. And I'm I'm sure if if um, female founders who are listening would like to find out more about the those um, networks that that Mel just mentioned, I'm sure getting in touch with Cubo, they can uh, hook you in. So, um, you know, we you raised to me that you know there's a that there's a small pool even at the start of female founders starting st startups and working in startups, but then when you also look at you know the VC side, the investor side, and the, the lack of decision makers at that table. I mean, it it's a global issue. I think, you know, mm -hmm. the, the data is like 15% of VC in America are women, so it must be lower in Asia. And so, you know, even in the Philippines, you must be amongst the minority of of investors. Um, and I'm sure our audience would love to to hear how you got into investing. Okay, how did they get into investing? Well. As you said, I came from the banking system basically, and then I moved on to actually working for a startup. Um, and you know, while I was in the startup, I was active with um, all these organizations that Mel actually mentioned. Uh, so again, I'd like to echo how important that is: expand going outside of your social circles. Um, and then eventually, I I, I set up um, what's this catalyst with one of the investors in that startup. Um, so that's really the story of how I got into it. Um, so a lot of it has mm -hmm. to do really with exposure um, and getting involved with like-minded people. Yeah, that's what I would so say. What, you know, in terms of barriers though, in, in terms of your journey of, of moving into startups, are there any, any key barriers that you think we can, can work as a group to help knock down? Well, is I it think, networks? Is it creating communities? What what could we do to to increase both the number of female founders, but also female investors in the Philippines? Oh, definitely. Like one is this: like have raising awareness, uh, in using the communities. Um, those who are able to succeed, make sure that you get to mentor other younger girls is important. Um, hopefully. I, I, I personally wish it would kind of bleed into our educational system, but that's a, that's a bigger <laughs> um, issue. Um, I think definitely just being loud about it and supporting these communities. I think if we can just invite more people into the ecosystem and s show them that this is uh, there's a lot of possibilities here for women, then you know it, it's going to be encouraging for everyone. Mm -hmm. I also like yeah. to add, um, sorry, no, you just let me. But um, most of these startups are actually um, uh, concentrated in Metro Manila, and one of the things that we're actually missing are startups in uh, provinces like uh, Cagayan or Tagigarao or Bicol, uh, or even the Visayas and Mindanao region that have been, you know, that have a lot of good talent but do not have access to the resources. So you know, um, a lot of um, uh, like Idea Space, uh, Kubo. Um, DOST, they're doing a lot of efforts to be able to really reach out to these um, people um, and reach out to founders and female founders in, in all of these areas so that we can have more startups. But I also feel like it's still not enough. Um, we still have a long way to go and we still have to also keep sharing resources to be able to make um, make everything successful, right? Um, these, these, uh, if, if it's hard for a female founder like me in Metro Manila to get funding, mm. it's equally and especially hard for a founder um, in the 
far-flung provinces of the Philippines to get funding. And, you know, these, these startups are not brought to the table as much because of all of the challenges in terms of either logistics, geography, transportation, that make it very difficult for, for people to succeed in startups in the Philippines. So I'd, I'd just like to add that. They're also another minority in this investing space that we need to be able to shed light on. Mm, exactly. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, I might, before we move on, I'll, I'll throw that out to either to Yen or, or Rhea, that, you know, how can we get more women? I mean, you know, on the, on the thesis that women will back women will be more likely to back women founders, how can we get more women acting as angel investors in the Philippines and outside of Manila? Have you got any suggestions as to, from your experience in other countries, what the Philippines can do? I mean, we'll start with Rhea, have you got any thoughts? Um, I think, uh, well, echoing a lot of the things that have already been said, if we're talking about increasing uh, women investors, I think in general, actually, you know, as much as we think that, you know, uh, the startup uh, sort of like ecosystem or just the, the idea of startups is already a common thing, it's actually not as common, right, um, in the Philippines as a whole, regardless of gender. Um, there's still a lot of people who don't even know what that means necessarily. Um, and then you add on the technology layer, right? Of course, I represent She Loves Tech, so we look at generally at tech startups and there's even less, right? Um, I actually, if you didn't know, like I was born and raised in the Philippines, but you know, I've been based overseas for the past 10 years. And every time I come back, I struggle so much to explain what I do whenever people ask me what I'm doing. Because I need to, I already know that they won't understand it if I explain the way that I usually do. So I need to like explain the in very, very basic terms. And by the end of it, I, I'm not even sure if they still understood, right? And these are very educated individuals. It's just that the way that, you know, the economy, I guess, works at the moment in the Philippines is very different, right? So I think the concept of, um, I mean, entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship, right? But adding like the startup concept, it's slightly different, especially fundraising startups. And then you move on to investment, right? I think a lot of people don't really understand the concept. Of course, they know like investment, the word investment, you know, investing money. But, you know, if we're talking about VC investment, and that's completely different, right? And I think from a, actually, that's one of the reasons of it as well, why in developing countries, um, you know, uh, I would say founders, don't really know how to fundraise properly because they don't really understand like you know what what it means to be a VC investor right whether the the sort of like limitate legal limitations for example that VC has why they select stars based on certain criteria um the, the, a lot of that contributes to why they are not receiving like funding right it doesn't mean that you know if you have like a you know profitable business uh cash positive business or you know a thriving business that a vc will automatically invest in you right because obviously at the end of the day they care about exit for example and if you don't showcase that then unfortunately they won't be able to invest in you um maybe in a different way if they just want to be like a normal investor perhaps but then you know a vc fund not necessarily so i think there's actually a lot of education that needs to be made um, definitely, I think we're going beyond like, gender at this point. It's like people just don't understand what like VC investment means. Um, so if you want to expand this uh, sort of like ecosystem in the Philippines, I think that you know in the same way that we're doing you know a talk like this, an event like this, we need to do the same for investment um, in order to get more investors, right? J women, men. Um, so yeah, I think it's a very it, it's more of a geographical issue, I would say, rather than specifically at least gender, right? Of course, you have the additional layer, but I really think that, you know, there is more of a, uh, yeah, economic and just the ecosystem that we need to sort of grow together, right? You know, all of us supporting each other. I think there's, you know, a lot more conversations like this. I think it's really helpful within, you know, uh, uh, organizations outside in public, uh, partnerships, um, yeah. No, thank you. That's very yeah, insightful, so right? If I could please add uh, to this, uh, topic. Yeah, so uh, regarding to your question that you asked about like how to get more angel investors uh, interested in this space. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to answer that in, in two points. First of all, in terms of the angel investor, um, I think a lot of the, you know, high net worth individuals out there, they, um, they don't have very, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of fam familiarity regarding to investing in startups. So making this an asset uh, class that is more popular to the high net worth individuals is one of the tasks that I think the ecosystem needs to do. Like, 
a lot of awareness and education around uh, what it is it is like investing in these uh, type of businesses. Uh, that is in terms of awareness. Second point is in terms of products, right? Um, so in order to the in order for the high net worth individuals to make investment into these companies, um, there should be a better legal framework for them to part their money into the co these companies, uh, either via an angel. Uh, network like main or uh, through funds um, like uh, which have open uh, you know open-ended fund structure like ours um, so an evergreen fund structure where we can raise money from individual investors so i think there should be more products out there that uh, enable these kind of investors to put mm -hmm. their money in um, uh, besides just direct investment into the company yeah Thank you. I mean, I'm just writing some notes as we go. It's all very interesting for me because this is, you know, it's something close to our heart as a um, middle angel investors network. We're trying to get more investors in the Philippines. But what I'm, I'm hearing throughout this is a theme of education in a way. It's both for founders and for investors so that they can learn to better talk to each other. So, I mean, that that's a separate issue to gender. But, um, you know, one We've probably hit about an hour now and, and, you know, as I mentioned at the opening, we don't need more awareness, we need more action. So what I'd, I'd like to get the panel's thoughts on is, you know, is what can those watching do that, that's immediately actionable to help female founders? Um, and I'd ask you each in turn, and, and I'll just go across the top of my picture as I can see it, but, you know, what are your, your three, one, two or three most actionable things that that an individual could do or change to to help female founders in the Philippines. So Mel, I'll start with you. Okay, so well, for one export, actually, um, on top of, of course, running the startup, we do a lot of education campaigns um, where we really um, uh, support um, uh, female founders or anybody that wants to go tech. So um, recently, our uh, CTO has launched a uh, uh, lunch and learn initiative. So it's a 30 minute lunch um, every Friday where we invite tech leaders to talk about building their tech. So anybody can go and um, we, you know, anybody who wants to learn more about tech and building the tech can, can go. This is open to everybody um, across regions in the Philippines. And this is our way to be able to really um, uh, have more tech startups in the Philippines, right? The other things that we're doing would be to really um, empower um, part of Part of our initiative would be to mentor other startups um, to really uh, make sure that uh, you know we want we want more Philippine startups to succeed. We believe that if most more, most or more of us succeed, then more people will be investing in the Philippines in general. So it's a win-win for everybody. So you know, people who are starting out, I personally put in time and effort to really tell them, okay, these are the business models that you should do. If you didn't get funding, that's okay. We can crowdfund or be more creative in our funding. So I am a, an advocate of bootstrapping because it has helped us through the years. And, you know, despite not getting funding, we are alive and well and now profitable. So it's something that we do um, on the side. So mentorship is one, awareness is one through um, talks and webinars is, is one, one thing that we do. Um, the second thing that we do really is to, um, and the more important one is to make sure that our startup stays alive. Right. Um, by making sure that we survive in so many aspects, we're able to really encourage more people to start their own startups. Right. Um, another thing that we do in, in one export is not just making sure our, our startup survives, but making sure all of our stakeholders. So these are micro, small and medium enterprises, as well as resellers and our distributors abroad. We make sure that they make money from the Philippines, that way they invest more money in the Philippines. So that's the second part. And last part is really um, uh, like last part is of course uh, making sure that uh, you know we, we go to these talks to make sure that VCs, angel investors, and investors are more aware of women um, startups, right? Women founded startups and startups who need uh, more assistance. So, so people in the PWD space, people who are in the um, people who are in the uh, um, provinces, far-flung provinces that don't have the same opportunities versus male startups. 
we try as much as possible to advocate away from comparing ourselves to male founders, but also just highlighting all of the um, great things about female founders um, or founders who do not normally necessarily get funding. So those are the three things that we have been doing um, on an active basis. And this is really because we want to be able to give back um, and we want to have more Philippine startups that are successful. More, again, more startups that are successful, more people will be investing in the Philippines. Exactly. Yeah. The, what, one thing. One thing I think the, the Philippines needs to do more is is definitely to celebrate successes more. You know, don't don't hide your uh, success under a bushel. Shout it out. So, um, moving along my line, uh, Raya, you're next. Have you got? Uh, what are your sort of actionable things? What can we take away from our, our chat today? Yes, I think, you know, Mel, you covered a lot of things already, but, you know, it's really short and sweet. I think um, to female founders, especially to our topic today, I think, you know, really it's just spend more time fundraising, right? People think that you fundraise once, twice, and that's it, right? You get mm. turned down and you you kind of like just don't fundraise anymore but actually you need to fundraise you need to spend like i wouldn't i don't know like 70 percent of your time as a founder to fundraise actually not yeah, just on operations if you know you are you want to scale right um you need to yeah build relationships like fund like even if you get turned down that may be a potential good relation for the future so spend more time fundraising really um and again celebrate your successes and just shout to the world what you're doing don't be shy um what's the worst thing that can happen right the worst thing that can happen is just like people don't care but really at least more people have heard what you're doing and what you've done amazingly and they may you know spread the word you don't know who's going to be listening right um I, and then in terms of i would say uh, uh the, the general public right um pay, pay it forward right as as mel you know echoing what mel said i think um everyone can really do their own part right whether it's to educate themselves but more importantly all of us have you know distinct like expertise skills that we may be able to contribute right you don't need to you know whenever we're talking about empowering women supporting women it feels like such a big thing right either you just say it as a courtesy right oh i support women or you know you feel like you need to create this entire movement and create this new like project but that's not really the case um you can totally just you know, mentor one start like an hour a month. That's already more than enough, right? If more people can do that small thing, then, you know, we will be able to create like a larger impact, right? Look, impact in volumes, basically. And I think that the more people are involved as well, right? Um, the more the ecosystem will grow, as Mel said, and at the same time, you know, uh, more people will kind of know about this, right? Without even having to like really advocate for this because, you know, people, there's more people involved, like, you know, people will kind of learn by example as well, I think. So, yeah, yeah I would say those things, mainly. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Um, Please. Did someone want to jump in or? Oh, yeah. Well, for me, it's number one, find a mentor who is in the field. You know, don't just like, talk to maybe a successful businessman, but there, what if the businessman is running a brick and mortar you know, company. It's very different from the startup ecosystem. So find a mentor in, who is in the field and, you know, try messaging through LinkedIn, um, follow incubators and accelerators, again, like Kubo, um, that constantly put out workshops and events. Because I think, you know, we, we're all on social media. So try to just check and review who you're following. Um, when you're following all the, of these groups and communities, it definitely helps boost your confidence and your knowledge. Um, personally, for me, I find following strong women very encouraging. And lastly, for me, um, you know, we're giving all these tips to founders and how they can sort of get ahead. Um, but for me, you know, at the end of the day, I think we just have to put it out there that the bulk of the responsibility of the burden should still be on the investor side or on this side of the panel. So I think VCs should really just, you know, talk to each other, give referrals, you know, help out other startups. You know, maybe if they don't fit your criteria right now, but you know a VC that might be able to bring them in, actively, you know, make referrals. And, um, you know, again, I just want to say that it's really on investors more than just more than the founders. We should also make a lot of adjustments. Yeah, so that's basically what I had to say. Thank you, Timmy. Um, Ian, if your three yes. actionable suggestions. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, I think the first one, the first thing is, yeah, please listen 
to what have been shared already because they are very very valuable um, advices. Um, uh, as for me, I would like to answer this question in relation to Beacon Fund because um, I see that we as, as Beacon Fund, we have actionable items for ourselves as well. So first of all, because our mission is to build an investment firm that works for women, uh, we would like to uh, yeah, you, to hear from the ecosystem and especially from the entrepreneurs, the kind of products that, that serves you. Because um, that is the first product that we have in the market, uh, but it's not the last, right? We will build a um, series of products so that it suits the female, entrep uh, the female entrepreneurs' needs. Uh, the best. So we would love to hear more ideas and understand your needs better in terms of fundraising. The second thing is uh, we would like to build success stories uh, to make the case that um, not only you know a unicorn is worth investing, but um, all the kind of business model and all the kind of um, you know like companies are worth investing as well especially the companies that have sustainable business model. It doesn't have to be a unicorn to be invested. And then uh, from an investor or limited partner point of view, uh, Beacon Fund would also hope to prove that, um, you know, the fund structure, um, the research fund structure is not uh, the only way um, to deploy money to the female entrepreneurs, but there could be um, you know, all the vehicles to uh, let the money, I mean, like to enable the, the investment uh, to female entrepreneurs as well. And one of which is the evergreen fund structure that we are uh, testing out. Um, and lastly, um, for Beacon Fund, we are also exploring, um, you know, all the opportunities to do capacity building for the, for the companies that we invest in. Uh, so that we will give a better chance for them to success. Um, so um, we would love to welcome any ideas as to uh, what kind of cap capacity building that you are looking for uh, as in entrepreneurs, what kind of resources that you need the most um, in order to help you uh, succeed. Um, yeah, so, so that's the action items for my side. Fantastic, thanks, Ian. Um, I've I've had a, a great time talking to you all. I'd like to personally thank you all for taking the time to to join me today. It's um I've actually I've learned a lot. It's uh it's been very interesting talking to you all. You've shared some very insightful perspectives on uh, gender and and the investment process. So thank you, and I, I hope the audience also uh, found it as a uh, useful as I did. So I'd like to, before we end, I'd like to thank you all again and, and thank uh, Yen from uh, Panama Capital and the Beacon Fund, Mel, the founder of One Export, uh, Raya, the co-founder of She Loves Tech and Timmy from Catalyst Ventures. So thank you all. Um, thank you all. I think uh, we will uh, move on from here. So Ross, I'll hand it back to you. Impact investing in Southeast Asia. Our world faces a multitude of challenges. Among them are climate change, limited access to healthcare and education, extreme poverty, and gender inequality. It is estimated that as much as 2.5 trillion US dollars annually is needed to solve these challenges. This creates the need to look for other sources of capital to solve these global challenges. Impact investing is the process of making investments into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate positive measurable gender, social, and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Impact investing plays a pivotal contributing role in unlocking the potential of private capital to address these global challenges. Impact investment attracts an extensive variety of investors, which can be broadly categorized as development financial institutions and private impact investors. Development financial institutions provide risk capital for economic development projects on non-commercial terms. Private impact investors are privately owned and operated entities 
that are focused on impact investing towards specific social and environmental goals. Today, the impact investing space has grown by leaps and bounds. As of 2018, it is estimated that impact investments have reached 228 billion US dollars globally. Southeast Asia has received 6% or 13.7 billion US dollars. Over 12 billion US dollars were invested in Southeast Asia between 2007 to 2017. 82% of the total capital has been utilized by sectors that promote financial inclusion, creating livelihoods, and expanding access to basic services. Impact investing in Southeast Asia is expected to continue growing because of large market opportunities, economic growth, and demographic trends. Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam have emergent impact investing ecosystems. 62% of all capital deployed and 56% of all the deals done in Southeast Asia. 7.6 billion US dollars worth of investments in the region were deployed in 295 deals. Impact investing also plays an important role in filling the financing gap of women's SMEs. Investing in women's SMEs offers compelling business and impact propositions. Without access to financial products that are responsive to their needs and appropriate risk return profiling, women's SMEs cannot realize their full potential. Investing in Women, an initiative of the Australian government, supports the growth of the impact investment industry to increase capital for women's SMEs in Southeast Asia. Investing in Women provides funding to invest in women's SMEs and supports the impact investing industry through research, networks, and knowledge sharing. Enable a better world. Invest in Women today. To know more, please visit investinginwomen.asia. Gender Lens Investing Economic growth is more robust and sustainable when men and women are able to fully participate in the economy. However, women continue to be underrepresented in the economy despite driving an estimated 80% of all consumer spending equivalent to 18 trillion US dollars. It is also estimated that 30% of the world's wealth is controlled by women, thus making the women's sector a significant and tapped market opportunity. Investors can take advantage of significant business and investment opportunities through gender lens investing. Gender lens investing refers to the use of capital to generate financial return and simultaneously advance gender equality. If impact investors look to create stronger social impact, reaching deeper into untapped markets of developing countries, then they need to incorporate a gender lens into their investment strategy. Impact investing cannot reach its full potential without embracing an intentional gender lens. In practice, investing with a gender lens leads to allocating capital to businesses that are women-owned and led, demonstrate workplace gender equality, and create and or deliver products and services that improve the lives of women and girls. Since 2007, only 40 million US dollars capital has been deployed with a gender lens in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Much more needs to be done. The broader awareness of gender lens investing remains limited. Investing in Women is an initiative of the Australian government that promotes impact investing with a gender lens in Southeast Asia. Investing in Women partners with impact investors to carry out gender lens investing for women's SMEs. Investors can be part of the solution. Drive gender equality and women's economic empowerment through investing. Enable a better world. Invest in Women today. To know more, please visit investinginwomen.asia. So we hope everyone enjoyed our session on why you should invest in women. Up next, we have another panel discussion called Pinay Tech Shiros from the lens of Filipina tech leaders. Here, we invite Pinay champions in the tech industry to share their unique experiences, challenges, and learnings as a female founder in a male-dominated field. 
Joining us today are a group of inspirational women who have each defined success in their own terms. To introduce to you our panel, we have someone who some of you might already recognize from our last Startup in I brunch. So please help me welcome Victoria Herrera, Head of Marketing at Kumu and co-founder of She Talks Asia. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Pinay Tech Shiro's panel discussion. Here in this panel, we discuss with Pinay champions in the tech industry to share a little bit about their unique experiences, challenges, and learnings as a startup female founder or a Filipina in tech in a male-dominated field. Oh, yes. <laughs> with the goal of promoting, empowering and raising awareness of women led startups in the country. So here with me today are very two powerful women who I have stalked online. Yes. And I deeply admire them for their intelligence, strength and ambition. And we can definitely look up to them as role models for females in the tech space. So to introduce our powerful panelists, here today, first we have Ms. Stephanie C, the founder and CEO of Thinking Machines Data Science. So let's please welcome Ms. Stephanie up to the stage. Hi, Ms. Stephanie. Hey. Okay, and then next we have with us Ms. Kat Manialak, the partner at Y Combinator. So let's all give a round of applause for Ms. Kat. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And by the way, if I say like Miss Kat or Miss Steph, it's it's very Filipino, right? When you when we say that, especially here in the country, it's our term of you know endearment and respect. But let me know if you also just want to be called Steph and Kat. I'm also very casual. <laughs> Either way is good for me. Okay. So first, I guess let's start from the very beginning. Um, if you guys can just introduce yourselves and do let us know what got you into the tech scene and how did you know that you wanted to work in tech? Um, was it early in, in your childhood? Was it in college? Like, tell us the story. Maybe we can start with Kat, with Kat first. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've worked at Y Combinator for seven years now. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Y Combinator, at Y Combinator, we fund startups. So we fund startups in big batches and then help them as they grow. So companies like Airbnb, Reddit, Dropbox, um, you know, have, have gone through YC and have worked with YC for many years. Um, so I've worked at YC um, for seven years. And, and part of my job is um, recruiting founders and getting really bright founders from around the world, hopefully more from the Philippines to apply um, to the program. Um, I, you know, read applications. I interview the companies and, you know, fund them. And, and then I also um, uh, help them like pitch. So help them figure out how to tell their stories in compelling ways, um, introduce them, you know, to press uh, the first time they want to, you know, kind of launch as a startup. Um, a startup that I've loved working with is PayMongo, which is a Filipino startup. Um, and so excited to see them doing so well. Um, and I got introduced to Y Combinator because um, I worked for uh, for a couple of years as the chief of staff to Alexis Ohanian. So Alexis was the founder of Reddit which was in the very first batch of YC. Um, they were uh, they went through YC in summer 2005 and were the first company that got acquired out of Y Combinator. Um, and so I helped Alexis sort of uh, with his angel investments and I learned a lot about community building online. And now Reddit is one of the biggest you know, uh, sites for community in probably the world, definitely in the US. Um, and before that, I worked at Wired Magazine. So I've always had an interest in technology and, and um, the intersection of technology and culture. Um, but I didn't know um, I was going to get into tech. Originally, I'd studied you know, um, journalism and film in college. I went to Northwestern. And um, I, I always thought, you know, I, I didn't have a clear idea of what I wanted to do when I grew up, essentially. Um, but then um, as a kid, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and I was exposed to a lot of tech. I always loved video games. So I always had an interest, but I never um, had that as my uh, sort of goal in life. So it sort of um, happened organically for me. That's such a beautiful story. And I can really feel your passion when you're storytelling and going down memory lane. How about you, Steph? How is your um, tech journey? Hey, well, um, um, first, I have to apologize in the recording. I have a bit of a cold, so I keep rolling off screen. <laughs> um, I promise it's not COVID. Um, so um, my tech journey um, is a bit different. So. Um, I, uh, I'm the founder of the Thinking Machines, we're data science 
Uh, we're a data science uh, firm, um, and we're almost exactly five years old. We'll be five years old next week. Um, so my journey um, was a bit, um, um, was very uh, much oriented towards um, like technical founding. Um, so when I um, was in college, uh, I started uh, my first startup with two friends. And uh, I was a CTO, uh, one of them was a CEO, the other one was our, uh, was our funnily enough, uh, it was a tech media startup. So she was our journalist editor in chief. Uh, very big titles for 321 year olds. Um, we had a lot of fun, raised like quite a good chunk of money and then lost it all, right? And uh, that was one of the hardest experiences of my life, but it was so incredibly fun. Um, the experience of building real technology uh, trying to solve problems, having your hypothesis about uh, what am I trying to do? How am I trying to change the world? And just doing it, right? And seeing if the world shifts or not. That exercise is incredibly empowering, incredibly addicting. Uh, it's in incredibly invigorating, even when you don't make it, which is most of the time. Um, so um, I've been in startups my whole career. Uh, after that startup, I was an early employee at a company called Wildfire Interactive in the Bay Area. We got acquired by Google. I worked at Google for a couple of years, got kind of bored of the full Google treatment, uh, free breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, you can only take so much of that <laughs> uh, if, if you have a lot of energy. Um, and so after about a year at Google, I started thinking about uh, what I wanted to do next. So um, by the way, at Wildfire at Google, um, I was a, um, analyst and a product manager uh, working on um, machine learning. I was actually working in machine learning uh, when um, before a lot of the modern technology for it existed, uh, which is it's been a lot of fun to see how much that field has changed in the last 10 years. Um, so coming back to the Philippines about five years ago, um, I figured like, all right, let's, you know, let's give it a real shot. What kind of company would make sense in the Philippine environment? Uh, what would be a very modern Filipino take on a data company. And so I started thinking machines. So we are a, a data science consultancy, uh, but we build a lot of our own tools and products to help organizations make better decisions. Uh, it's a company with a very strong civic heart. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, collecting uh, and making accessible um, civic data sets for the Philippines, so traffic data sets, weather data sets, uh, geospatial processing. Um, a lot of these things are, and just telling great stories uh, about them to help people understand what information is out there. Uh, and then building data platforms to help organizations make actual decisions on it. Um, in the Philippine ecosystem, uh, not just in tech, but in general, right? There's this tendency to uh, do this thing where decisions are made by the most senior person in the room. Um, so interestingly enough, um, uh, Victoria, when you were calling us like um, Miss, right, or Ma'am, I think it's very indicative of a culture of, um, of um, respect that kind of shades into over, uh, over emphasis on hierarchy in the Philippines. And that is often, for me personally, I philosophically do not think that is a great way, that's not a great attitude uh, towards uh, building something new, being very rigorous and very scientific about your thinking and does not lead to the best decisions. So uh, what we try to do at TM is to uh, both build the technology layer to help people use data in their decision-making instead of who's the most senior, who's the oldest, who's the loudest in the room, who's, who's frat bra just texted him that you know this, the road in front of his house is fret flooded, right? Those are not good uh, decision criteria. So on one hand, we try to build these data uh, technologies. And on the other hand, we try to teach people uh, because you can give somebody all the tools in the world, but if they don't have this attitude of rigorous thinking of uh, wanting to make good data-driven decisions, uh, you don't really get anywhere. So this is why TM by nature is a long-term company, a long-term play. It will take a very, very long time uh, to change hearts and minds uh, about data. Sorry, that's my uh, <laughs> that's my whole uh, Monday morning pitch. Um, um, <laughs> that uh yeah like it's been really fun being a technical founder in the philippines uh there's not a lot of us and there's not a lot of women uh, in this absolutely. space as well so uh it'll be fun to have this chat yeah absolutely i mean just kind of throwing the script out of the window i feel like from what you guys just said there's so many opportunities for different talking points just being a woman in the industry is one being a woman in the industry in the philippines or with filipino culture 
right, is a whole other experience as well. Um, that's why one of the questions as well we were going to ask was, you know, when it came to making your career decision, you know, did your parents say anything, right? Because normally in Filipino culture, it's like a doctor, a lawyer, um, you know, they already have things planned out for you. Um, but it sounded like in terms of your stories, you really, you know, followed your own path in your own direction. How was the um, interplay of culture or family upbringing, um, did, did that have a decision in, in your career? I asked a lot. I, that was like a really long sentence, by the way. But I guess for this, we'll start with Kat, with Kat and then Steph again. Sure. Um, yeah, I was lucky. My, my parents were never, they always were like, do what makes you happy. And they didn't give me a very clear sense of direction. They were just like, we trust you to make good decisions. But, um, you know, they worked in insurance. And so it was something that's, you know, very stable and, and steady. And when I uh, started working with Alexis, um, they had never heard of Reddit. And at the time, Reddit wasn't that popular. Um, and they kept asking like, well, are they paying you? Do you have a real paycheck? It, like, have you gotten the money in the bank? Like, they didn't really believe that it was real <laughs> at the time. Like, they were like, just, you know, just making sure. Um, and so they they certainly until you know it took a while but uh i think it's like after the facebook movie came out the social network they were like oh startups this could be a real thing you know um so they didn't um they didn't discourage me but they weren't super encouraging in the beginning either they were just sort of like who knows what this this world is <laughs> <laughs> how about you steph it's so funny. I think my dad's exact sentence when I told him uh, I was starting this company is he, he gives me this look and he says, uh, well, you better do it because if you don't, I don't want you to be mad at me 10 years later for not letting you follow your dreams. <laughs> um, I think um, it's, um, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's pretty much it. I think, I think my family um, is a bit more entrepreneurial uh, than most. Uh, my parents started uh, a company, um, grandparents on both sides have started companies. So actually, I do come from like a pretty entrepreneurial background. And that part was not uh, so terrifying for them. That's awesome. I mean, I just feel like I, you know, I've been working in the startup space for about less than three years, um, really learning the ropes and also learning it in the Philippines. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you're like, oh, this is a whole other battle, right? Um, I, I forgot to mention earlier, I work for a startup called Kumu, which is a social uh, social entertainment platform, but technically it's live streaming, right? And I remember when I told my mom, I'm working for a live stream startup company in the Philippines, in a country which you know doesn't have the best reputation for internet and the startup scene isn't the most popular as well. She really, um, she believed in me, but she also had that like, are you gonna be okay? Have a backup plan, right? You know how parents are. So just, um, I feel educating parents, also our culture, also the industry of like, hey, this is what the startup world is. This is what it takes. This is, these are the challenges. Mom, this is normal. I will cry at midnight, you know, just answer the phone, <laughs> you know, those types of um, the awareness that I feel are happening more frequently than not, especially here in the Philippines, which is why I'm actually grateful for panel discussions like this, you know, we're able to um, have the open conversation and the dialogue so people understand like, hey, guys, this is normal. This is a normal journey. This is what it takes to be in the startup space as well. And if you're really serious about it and passionate about it, we're here to help. We're here to provide um, case studies and inspirational stories. So going back to the panel at hand, um, when you guys did join the industry, did you feel like there were any barriers being a female? Mm. We can start with Steph here and then to Kat. I, I wouldn't call them, they are not, they're never hard barriers, right? They're never hard barriers. Nobody's, nobody ever literally goes up to you and says, you're a girl, that's so gross, get out. Um, <laughs> um, but there's a lot of soft barriers. And what I call soft barriers are uh, things where you may feel some discomfort. And um, I think socials, I think socials in technology, if you go to a, uh, if you go to a conference, if you go to the Python conference or well, that's not true. PyCon, PyCon has done a lot to become like very, very welcoming these days. So, um, but but quite a lot of um, open source conferences or industry conferences, uh, when the attendees are like eighty percent dudes or eighty five percent dudes, 
all the post event socials and all the uh, all of the um, hallway conferences, right, are are very doodly. Like they'll want to go drinking. They um, want to do. Um, I think at one point I was invited to like uh, poker games after the conference. Um, and it, I'm, I'm like invited, right? But there's something like a bit like psychologically shocking about walking into like a room where it's like a smoke filled room where there's like a hundred dudes playing poker very aggressively and drinking. You're just like, God, like, do I, am I really going to be able to hang here? And a lot of business does get done there. Like a lot of relationships get built in that kind of environment. So uh, those kinds of soft barriers are uh, pretty hard to find your way around. Um, especially, yeah, especially on the engineering side, where I think if you're in a startup conference, there's, in, in general, like if you look across the business teams, the the sales team, the business team, the uh, product team, the engineering team, you have maybe like 30, 40% women these days. But if you're just solely in like the, uh, it, I guess in the Philippines, like IT, IT and software engineering, then it's like 80, it's still like, and data science, it's still like 80% dudes. Um, so those soft barriers are really hard and I don't have great advice for like young women in the space. Like I uh, feel like I just got lucky um, and didn't have to, didn't like need them as much um, as uh, women who are maybe like raising funding. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't think about it all that much earlier in my career. And I think really being at Y Combinator and in the past, maybe five years, a lot more conversation is being had about being a woman in tech and, and more getting more underrepresented people in tech. And, um, you know, we've been running at YC. Uh, it was called the Female Founders Conference. And now we're calling it the Future Founders Conference. It's actually um, happening in, in just a couple of days. But we, um, you know, I think for me, looking at at who applies um, to YC. When I started seven years ago, uh, the founders of YC, Paul Graham and Jessica Livingston said, you know, probably, um, you know, the vast majority of people who've heard about Y Combinator are um, people who've heard about us through Hacker News, um, which is, you know, a sort of like Reddit for tech news. And, and it's probably 85, 90% male, um, mostly white, I would imagine, um, though now it's very international. Um, and so, you know, my initial job was they said, what if we had one person thinking about where do you find smart, hardworking people who haven't thought about starting a company yet or who haven't heard about YC? Like, how could that grow, you know, um, the population of founders um, that we're able to work with? And so that was a big part of my job. But even today, only about 15 percent of the founders that apply to YC are women. Um, and so uh, that, and so on average, you know, I think it's about 23 percent of the companies we fund have a woman founder. But, you know, anywhere between, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the overall founders we fund are, are women. So um, I think it's a constant it's constantly on my mind, like where, uh, you know, how do we find uh, and encourage more women to start companies um, because it is still so heavily male. And it is it is crazy walking into, you know, one of our Tuesday night dinners. It's it's still, you know, hundreds of men in the room. And and um, and so um, it's something that I think about a lot. And I and I think part of it is YC is always traditionally funded tech companies or and and, and um, even in the US, I think it's only about 18 to 20 percent of computer science graduates are women. Um, and so uh, it's. I think it's an ongoing sort of challenge for all of us, like who are already in the industry, to to figure out how do we open doors and and how do we, you know, push more women through and 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 highlight more women. And in the VC world, which is about you know a step above YC in terms of funding, so like only four percent of women are getting you know the VC funding that's given out every year. So uh, there's a lot that needs to change, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to share an observation. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go for it. Uh, yeah, um, just to share an observation. I, I think the, across the board, uh, there's um, like 20% women across the board, but it's not evenly distributed in, in my, um, from what from what I can see. So, for example, um, women tend to kind of gravitate towards a organizations. Um, so, at Thinking Machines, right, our data science team is um, maybe in the newest hire we just got, a guy, like it's a little less than half women, uh, but I think we have the highest proportion of uh, women on a data science team, at least that I'm aware of the Philippines. And um, I think it's the kind of thing where once a place becomes like comfortable, women just know each other. Like, because um, if, you were, if you're in a room of a hundred guys and it's happened to me, and you see one other girl there, you're gonna go introduce yourself. Um, so I find that the um, while there aren't that many um, 
women in tech, the networks between women in tech are pretty strong, which kind of leads to these interesting outcomes where uh, you'll have a, a number of companies. It's never majority women still for, for some reason. Um, but um, instead of 20% women being spread evenly across 100% companies, you'll have like four companies that are all like half women and all the rest of them are like all dudes. And so that's like a really weird, tricky barrier because then the question is, how do you get the first woman on the team and then how do you get the second and third, right? Because that poor first woman, she's gonna have like a horrible time um, as, the, as the first female hire somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the things I also heard, it's kind of like, you know, people in industry are working hard to open doors from women, but sometimes there's kind of like the stop internally from some women that should I even walk through this door? Do I even belong here? Right. And what I was also picking up, it was kind of because the social setting was predominantly male. It was kind of like, do I even fit in? <laughs> and that could already be um, maybe not an obvious, not necessarily block but it is a conversation women sometimes have in their head right like it's a soft block it's a soft, yeah and it, it it and you know women and thoughts in their head right <laughs> what sometimes you're like okay you're you review something you said in a meeting or you review you know um yeah that, that's just one example i can think of but it's a lot of the self-talk some women go through as well when it comes to even walking through the door right? Even if the door is open. So what are some of your thoughts around um, creating positive self-talk for women entering the founder or startup space? We can start with um, Steph and Kat. And by the way, I'm trying hard not to say miss because it's just habit. <laughs> but we can start with Steph. Steph and yeah, let's Kat. start with that self-talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kat, if you if you have something, please yeah. jump in. I can say what worked for me personally, and I've talked to a lot of um, early stage founders who I think would would agree with some of this. But one is um, creating a network of other women who are founders as well. So I mean, it helps having um, you know. So I meet every quarter with a group of you know ten to fifteen women who are CEOs of tech companies or investors, and um, we've been meeting for years now. Like and and it's it's um we we know each other both you know sort of professionally and, and as friends and um it's it's helped to have people to bounce things off of like am I crazy like this happened to me and like and and to have that you know peer group of people saying like no this is you know this is not just in your head this is real or or you know or don't worry about that or or talking to people about how they overcame their own challenges or you know even um, people will ask questions about say like hey I'm raising a Series B like are these regular terms, like did, did this and was this investor good to work with? Just having that community has really, really helped. Um, and then, and then um, in terms of the self-talk, I started going to just like a therapist coach, maybe like four, three, four years ago. And that has really um, helped me understand like when I'm doing negative self-talk and, and when, when, it, when things, when issues that I'm having are real and whether, um, or if they're just like, I'm just telling myself like I'm doing things wrong and I'm like projecting that other people are, are you know, are um, have issues with me or whatever. And it's, it's just really opened my eyes to that and made me also become a better kind of like interpersonal communicator. Um, and so I think having both like a, a small peer group network of people who are also doing similar things as you are, and then having a really like a third party to talk to on a on a regular basis has been like incredibly helpful for me and i think a lot of founders i've talked to have, have found it's helpful as well awesome what about I you super Steph? endorse that everybody should get therapy every starter founder should get therapy yeah. men women like doesn't matter <laughs> get therapy no, um, it's really like, like, i love yeah. therapy <laughs> Co -founders <laughs> also, who do like couples therapy together basically what? Oh, that makes so much sense. Co-founding a company together, you're basically married. You share that you have kids, you have bills, you got <laughs> you got to make decisions about your future. And isn't that the number one reason why startups fail? Like co-founder disagreements. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So actually, yes. Everybody watching this, go go find a therapist. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm loving the honesty in this conversation because people don't talk about that, and people don't talk about that here. Right. Um, even just the word therapist can have some, you know, um, labels attached to it. But I love it. I I love the fact that here in a panel discussion about uh, women empowerment and, you know, startup 
entrepreneurs and that sort of thing, we have the discussion of therapy. And this is one of the first times, maybe even ever, I've heard therapy being discussed as well as, you know, as a pro in a startup panel. And I've had several panels, right? And it's- I, I uh, one thing that sort of changed the way I thought about it was, um, so Alexis um, Ohanian, who I used to work with before, was the founder of Reddit, but he then married Serena Williams, like the tennis player. And what he said was all the best athletes in the world, now who he knows personally, he's like, they all have coaches. Why shouldn't CEOs and people and exactly. leaders? Exactly. And he's like, basically therapists and like, and you know, executive coaches, they're, they're essentially the same thing as a coach to a, to a star athlete. So that, I was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's so beautiful. And again, ladies, that's so refreshing to hear in a panel discussion here in the Philippines as well, because just opening that doors and telling people, hey, it's normal. It's okay to ask for help. This is a stressful job, right? <laughs> like this is a stressful adventure. But and just um, hearing you guys say reaching out, building a community, finding a, a therapist or a mentor, that sort of thing, um, that just being so integral for your own personal lives, did you also have, for example, a female mentor to look up to or a coach when you were starting your career or in your career? Steph. We can start with Steph. <laughs> yeah, um, well, um, actually, well, the, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, the, um, the first job I had uh, at a startup, um, I deliberately picked a company that had a woman as a CEO. And in my, like, um, in my mind at the time, I figured like, I was like, okay, look, um, I want to understand like up close how, because there's so many just open questions I had at the time about how do you, uh, you know, when you're a CEO, you have to work with investors, you have to work with customers, you have to work with your team. Um, you have to be like, you have to manage your own psychology really well uh, because every day you could be going through eight different conversations where every single conversation has a completely different emotional tone and is equally important. A quick example, right? Uh, you start your day. You're trying to close a. You're, you're trying to close a deal with a major client. Uh, the next thing you're trying to do is an angry customer. Uh, you need to deal with that. The next thing you're trying to do is you're trying to recruit um, a, a star onto your team. The next thing you're trying to do is somebody on your team had a parent who passed away. The next thing you did, and you know, like that's that's just like the massive highs and lows. And even that's just a normal day. That's not even your in a fundraising round or in a, a super high pressure environment. Um, so how do you? Um, so this is why therapy is important for everybody. You just like need it. You need that brain coach. You need that feelings coach. Um, but I wanted to join the startup with a female CEO to kind of see from the outside um, as an early employee, like how how did she just do things, right? Like literally, like how would she run a meeting? How do people react and respond to her? And I can talk to her about like what uh, what she was uh, thinking and doing. So Victoria, she's a fantastic, fantastic CEO. Uh, she took wildfire. Um, all the way to into like a pretty great exit and was like a very good person throughout uh, the whole thing. Uh, was not uh, a stereotypical founder in the sense that she didn't have a temper. She was like the nicest person. I'd, uh, she was the kindest person I'd ever met in my life. Even when she was making very tough calls, um, she was able to do it uh, with a lot of grace. So just um, by by example, she was a fantastic, uh, fantastic mentor figure. Um, and I think more important than specific mentors, because I don't have a specific mentor uh, right now who's a woman who like, I call every couple of weeks, but I have communities. Um, I have a community of uh, peers in the startup scene. Um, and like like cat, cats, like um, um, 15, uh, 15 founders group, right? Um, I, have, I have my equivalents uh, that I can check in with, who can sanity check me, who I can feel safe asking stupid questions to. It's like, shouldn't I already know this? Like, am I not an experienced startup founder? Like, should I not already know uh, what this legal document should look like? And I don't want to look like an idiot in front of the guys. So <laughs> I have a peer group to ask. Um, but I do like, um, well, like Kat, for example, I see your name pop up on Y Combinator. So I read Hacker News, right? And so uh, when I see names like uh, Adora Chung, uh, Kat Paniala, I'm like, ah, even though I um, don't often watch uh, the uh, or, or uh, read uh, the Y Combinator stuff, like part of me feels better just seeing those names come up and being like, there are cool women doing work in the tech space. Like I'm not alone in this. I don't need to talk to them to feel comforted by uh, to feel like strengthened by their existence. Beautiful answer. How about you, Kat? Um, I think 
early on, uh, I, I working at Wired, um, my boss was the founder of the Webby Awards, and and then she ended up, you know, selling it, and then and then uh, now she's now she's at Time Magazine, but she was at Wired, and she's always been uh, sort of a huge, you know, inspiration to me. Her name's Maya Drazen, um, and I learned a lot from her. And then obviously, I think um, uh, the founder of Y Combinator, Jessica Livingston, I got to learn a lot from her, um, you know, and she. I mean, she built YC from the ground up, very much a startup founder herself. Um, and so, um, but I love what you're saying, Steph, about about working, uh, you know, being intentional about seeking out, um, you know, working for a company that had a female CEO. And it's something that I, I've also been thinking about a lot, but because then, you know, now, um, you know, we have a reasonably diverse team, but it's, it's still very heavily male. And I always think about like, oh, when, you know, in the thing I do next, I would love to work with like a woman who's CEO or a woman who's like head of the company. Um, and so I think that that's really smart. Um, and then also think just like in my life, I've, I've you know, I think I, I've also thought about like, um, not so much mentors as uh, advocates. So like Alexis, for example, um, you know, I worked with him and he wasn't just, a, I did learn stuff from him. He was a mentor, but he also advocated for me. Like he was the person who went to Paul Graham and Jessica Livingston and told them that they should hire me. And he's consistently that person or, you know, um, I have a couple people in my life who are consistent, consistently that pe that person who like will go out and like go to bat for you. And I think that's an important role to have as well um, is not just sort of someone to learn from, but someone who will get there and advocate for you. That's beautiful. And what I'm also picking up, it's, you know, not just community and finding a mentor, it's also an advocate, you know, um, doesn't need to be the same same gender, but someone who believes in you as well, just an, an advocate for you um, and to help you, I guess, see the greatness in yourself in the days where you don't feel that great. <laughs> um, when it comes to, for example, being a female in the space of, of leadership, do you see any stark differences with how it is where you're from and if you've worked in other countries or other cities, I guess really anchoring it on this conversation for you, Steph, how it is in the Philippines versus, for example, on the US or Singapore and for you, Kat, specifically in the States? Um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, I, uh, one thing about the Philippines is that, um, yeah, there aren't a lot of women in the tech space here, but there's a lot of women um, everywhere else. Uh, there's a lot of very senior women. Like I have pitched to, as for, for like the clients that we have on, right? Um, everybody has either worked for a woman in their career. Uh, sometimes my client CEOs are, are women. Like uh, there's... Um, there's a lot more comfort with the idea of women as decision makers and women in power here, so that um, there's no um, there's no feeling of uh, discomfort. And there's like a lot of women in like I IT here, so the idea of like oh like uh, a woman is here to pitch us um, some data science technology uh, is not like really crazy to organizations here. There, of course, there's everything else, right? There's the actual deal, uh, but, it, but I don't find that gender uh, plays. Um, a big a big role there in in people's inherent expectations uh, whereas I think in the US uh, when I was working there uh, there was a bit more of the surprise that like oh you're you're the engineer I, I thought you were the uh, like marketing girl I'm like oh shit like <laughs> here we are again um, but and like frankly like women in marketing in the states do not get the kind of respect that they should get um, I, I find it a lot of uh, this is maybe like not a uh, this is a um, hacker versus hustler thing. Uh, I think sometimes uh, the engineering team has this mindset. Well, both sides can have this mindset where the engineering side has a mindset that, oh, what do the business people do anyway? Like they, all they have to do is like sell this shit, right? And on the business side, uh, we have um, the negative manifestation of this. It's like, oh, the engineers like can never tell me when any features are gonna get done. They can never tell me how to plan for my roadmap. And can't they see that we need this million dollar sale or we're gonna die? Um, and um, so because a lot, most women are, um, I think, mostly on the uh, marketing account management and sales sides, they get kind of unfairly dinged um, <laughs> because of uh, because of those factors. I do definitely see, um, especially with a lot of the technical women who are technical founders that I work with. Um, 
they, they do feel that where you know, they'll walk into a, a pitch session or even the women who are CEOs and, and the investors will all turn to the man and ask them questions first. Yeah. And they'll be like, I'm the CEO or I'm the technical person. Like you can direct your questions at me. Um, I've actually more often felt uh, the what you're talking about in terms of the technical versus non-technical because I'm you know started off my career as as you know, non-technical and I'm from you know more of a like marketing background and so I've always that's been more of my struggle is like figuring out how to like build you know my niche and 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 to to where I can be most helpful and useful um, because there's definitely at least in San Francisco. Um, everyone really prizes that technical. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're like the you know golden goose, and it's like everyone else is like we're just here to support you. So it's a uh, that's that's where I I find I get more of my like imposter syndrome or or, or or you know anxiety around that is that you know I I don't come from a technical background and, and how do you balance that? Absolutely. And do you feel like um, culture also plays a part? whether it's like, you know, us being Filipino or how, or Asian and how it is also in the US? I will say one thing I learned, um, you know, being in the part of my combinator, like there are like, you know, 16 of us. And at the beginning, and I grew up with a not very, um, I, I, think, I think this might be Filipino culturally, is like you're not very direct and like confrontational. Right? Yeah. Am I right? And so I never grew up being comfortable with confrontation. Um, and so I watched, you know, people have these like really like kind of heated disagreements in the partner room. And they they'd be like, I'd be like sort of uncomfortable at first. And then after the meeting, I saw those two people say, like, hey, you know, this wasn't personal at all. I just feel really strongly. And and they're like, Yeah, yeah, cool. And then everyone's friends and it's fine. But at first I was very made very uncomfortable by that kind of communication. And then I kind of learned like how to lean into that or how to be, be more comfortable with different styles of communication, which I think culturally I was originally not okay with as much. I feel you. And sometimes you're like, is it because I'm not uh, not brave right now to talk about this? Or is it because I don't, right? You have all these thoughts to get in your head, but I love the fact that we are having at least open discussion of, hey, you know, it also, could be our culture, it could be this, maybe I just need to see a therapist, it could be a lot of things. But just the fact that we're having these open conversations is already a step forward, especially um, here, right? Just, just let's just show everyone what we went through. <laughs> um, let's share the lessons of the community. Um, when it comes to being specific, um, as a female in the, in the workplace, in a male-dominated workplace, do you ever have um, non-negotiables for getting ahead? Or do you feel like, you know, some best practices work better than others, obviously? Wait, what do you, can talk a bit more about that. What, uh, what's a non-negotiable? A non-negotiable I've been working on personally is having those direct conversations with my male colleagues, especially the male executive team. Um, I kind of give myself the, that that pep talk, like, okay, if you're not happy with it, you will tell them within 24 hours. You know, you're not going to wait a week and simmer on that. That's just my experience, but I'm very, I'm fairly learning how to speak up a lot in um, a lot of these intimidating conversations. So, you know, what about for you? Is there any non-negotiable in your career that you've experienced? Oh, oh. I, I think that, yeah, sorry, that that maybe is like a little bit uh, trickier. I think everybody, uh, everybody has their values, right? And you can't, you can't, you can't go against that. Uh, and people just weight things a bit differently per person. Um, if I think about it non-negotiable, I guess the way I'm interpreting the question is, um, like, what's a situation that um, there's you just have to like walk away from uh, no matter um, no matter what, or like walk towards no matter what. Um, and I suppose that um, uh, for me, uh, there is this matter of, uh, I guess like respect in, in, in some ways, um, um, respect of not just me, but of my team. So uh, for example, we work with a lot of clients, right? And um, 
um, because we're doing um, because we're doing consulting work. Uh, our, one of our jobs is to like really get, be excellent, excellent listeners. That's what I tell my team. We're uh, there as engineering consultants, and uh, both things are equal of equal importance. Uh, to understand what you're going to build, you have to understand the problem. Otherwise, you're just uh, you're just building toys. Um, so um, in those situations, sometimes we will encounter clients who are like a bit unpleasant in the moment who are resisting change, who uh, are, don't really believe in what we're trying to do at their organization, but they're like their other uh, colleagues do. And I tell my team that's okay, but what's non-negotiable is if you get harassed at work, right? Uh, either by a client or within the team, that's not something we can like counsel away. That's something where I have to step in immediately and uh, no, like there is no negotiation there. There is no uh, rehabilitation there. It, it just has to be like a walk thing. And that's a bit controversial. It's not always, it doesn't always, um, not every founder will choose to do that. But for me personally, I would not negotiate. I really would walk away um, because I think that that's, it's just so hard and so fundamentally it's it's so hard to change that about a client or about a colleague uh, that it, it is really far better uh, for me that we we part ways on that issue of uh, for so, so for me like the one non negotiable is like uh, you know if you sexually harass not me because like in terms of like class and power differential like that is also what harassment is about like I've never encountered it but like that's not a like I'm the founder CEO of this company. I have like a very fancy uh, degree, and I have like pretty well connected in this community. So like I don't, I really don't get that. It's more of like the younger women on my team who are maybe just getting started in their careers, like in uh, more vulnerable positions, like less sure of themselves, or younger uh, women who are just seeking funding. Like they're, uh, they're, they're. Um, more likely to get preyed on. Let me put it that way. Uh, and for me, the second non-negotiable at work is. Um, dishonesty around data. Um, that's like, that's that's core to who we are as a company. It's core to who I am as a person. If you're lying about uh, your data, then 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 what's real? What's real? <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what I tell our clients. That's our one non-negotiable is that uh, we um, do building, we build everything, but we will not, um, we, will, we will absolutely not do anything to um, assist you with uh, concealing changing just this mm -mm, like you got to make decisions based on the data that you have not on not on uh numbers that we won't help you magic up numbers uh, so it's part of our professional non-negotiables um is, is that kind of what uh the direction that you were going in victoria yeah i love that answer what i'm really picking up is how it's also anchored to your core values as a company right with respect being important with honesty being important um I, I, I love that answer, actually. I wrote notes. <laughs> what about you, Kat? I, I love what you're talking about in terms of, um, you know, if you're working, you know, not working with clients who are disrespectful of your team. And, and um, we don't have clients, but at YC, we're, you know, a community of, we funded over 6,000 founders and we have, you know, thousands of investors come to demo day. And, um, and one thing we, we have an ethics policy, right? So we we try not to fund. And of course, when you fund, you know, we're funding 400 plus companies a year, there might be some bad apples in there. But generally, we're looking to, to work with founders who are good people who are respectful, who um, and, and investors as well. And we tell all of our founders and we tell the investors as well, if you disrespect our founders in any way, especially if you sexually harass any of our founders, like you will not be invited back to demo day back to our community. And you know, we, uh, our founders have a, a database of investors that they all, you know, kind of share their feedback on the investors. So within the YC community, you can see who are the great investors to work with, who are the great partners, who, who will help you, um, and who are people who have not respected founders in the past in the community. And I, um, and I think that is really important and, and having those um, sort of values as a community, um, since that is essentially in, you know, the core of what we are is, is really important. Awesome. Um, I have, I quickly thought of a story in terms of a non-negotiable, and this is something I spoke about in another panel discussion, when they always turn to the females to take notes, right? <laughs> and like write it down. And then, so I had this, I had this conversation every time I talk to a female in tech, they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> Remember that I was going to look at you. And then one time, one of my colleagues, um, 
messaged me and said, hey, Vicky, like, can you take notes of this meeting? And I think I was just so fed up. I was like, no. <laughs> and they were like, whoa, OK. <laughs> and then I had to explain. I'm like, sorry, you you all. I don't know if you're aware of this because maybe you're just not. Um, you can't always just ask the females like, buddy, it ha it's your turn today. And they're like, oh, OK. <laughs> right? And just sometimes educating them or having that honest conversation because they also didn't know it was a thing. So yes, that's that was a non-negotiable I started doing. <laughs> Very small, but still. Um, so when it comes to, for example, um, females entering this workspace, um, what important skills do you feel that the younger generation need to invest in? We can start with Steph. <laughs> Hmm. What do they need to invest in themselves? Because yeah. <laughs> like everybody's so unique in how they and and let me expand that right. Like um, for anybody who's um, young women, young women, um, uh, queer, non-binary, very uh, just in terms of like gender expression. I think that uh, I think that's one thing I'm I'm hoping to see more of in uh, the startup community. Like. Um, Fun fact, there are a lot of trans women in, um, historically, there have been a lot of trans women in uh, the software engineering industry um, in the US and in, in the Philippines, uh, well, and I, I think not so much, I'm just like less aware, I, I think. Um, uh, but in terms of if, if, you're, uh, if you're a young, if you're a teenager, if you're somebody young who's trying to get into tech uh, and you are a woman or you have like a non, um, um, you don't like fall into the gender binary, right? Um, in investing in yourself is not just investing in your, uh, you should and must invest in your like professional hard skills, uh, whether that's the business side skill set or whether that's uh, the the builder, builder uh, engineering, um, software engineering side skill set, yes. Uh, but you have to put extra work into investing in your own, uh, in your own emotions, <laughs> your emotional landscape, your, your psychological health, your, uh, because um, when you enter in the startup journey, uh, the normal startup journey, like there's no like the quote unquote normal startup journey is is so hard, so full of like highs and lows. And if you layer onto that all the different like highs and lows and stresses and struggles of being um, somebody who's not like who doesn't have a mainstream uh, gender identity, then um, it, it it can be it can be stunningly difficult, like shockingly difficult. But please don't give up. Like uh, um, invest early on in your uh, emotional health, and you actually will see a lot of professional rewards from that. Awesome. I think if I could go back in time, I would have uh, invested more time learning uh, like to code, learning the technical side of things. Um, and you don't even necessarily, I don't know that I would necessarily have become the CTO of a company, but I think having that working knowledge early on, um, it just gives you a lot of respect um, in the industry. And it gives you, um, it's just uh, working with, you know, one of my colleagues, Jared Friedman, for example, he was a CTO of Scribd and, and now he he runs a software team at YC and his he just thinks about um, solving problems in a different way. And I love hearing like how he sort of decides to like unpack a problem or to solve it. And, and, and I would have loved to spend a little bit more time on that side of things. And so if I could go back in time, I probably would have um, learned more of that. That's oh, awesome. I do want to add that's 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 really a good point. Like, um, don't just um, um, I think that sometimes when young people ask me for advice, God, I'm not that old. Why am I keep, why do I keep saying young people? <laughs> when teenagers ask me for advice, they're really looking for like a guidebook with steps to professional success. And I keep saying like, no, follow your intellectual joy, right? Like um, read a lot, just read a lot about everything. Um, if you are, um, if you are in Philippine science and like very much on the technology, like engineering track, um, read a lot, like read some philosophy, um, try to do sales, like really just try to sell something for a summer. Um, feel like, uh, you'll feel so much more empathy, understanding, you'll build better organizations and businesses. Um, if you're some Ateneo management engineering kid, who's like, all I need to do is to hire an IT guy. It's like, no. You learn how to code. There are so many no code tools out there. Like you get you get your hands dirty a bit and you'll become a much better founder, a much better partner uh, for for having for having done for having done that, just expanding your horizons. And um, nobody knows what's gonna happen next, right? Like I got lucky twice in my career. It's never gonna happen again. 
Uh, I got lucky because I started my career and joined a company that was working on social uh, technology around social media right when the landscape was still like everything was still open question like Facebook was not as dominant uh, as it as it um, was now so in three years that I worked with wildfire the um, landscape changed so much uh, mobile um, um, social was on desktop first and then it showed up on mobile now you have things like Kumu where like, it's it's totally like morphed like uh, in, in very different exciting ways and then I got lucky a second time where uh, I was I started I got my start pretty early in the field of like uh, data technologies and like I'm just finding it so exciting there's this huge explosion of like ideas talent energy startups um, in this space and uh, and it all comes from like strong you have to have strong intellectual underpinnings of it but but you can't predict it right you can't say oh if you spend three years studying um, biomechanical uh, devices now, like 10 years from now, it's going to be this huge biohacking thing that you're going to be part of. You just do what intellectually like really triggers your joy. You keep investing in it. And I think that that's, um, even if it doesn't end up being a billion dollar company, you will feel a lot of personal fulfillment and um, enjoyment from it. Beautiful answer. One second. Oh, wait, uh, remind me of the quote. Let's repeat the question. <laughs> so, no, no, it was just pretty much, it goes back to what the next generation yeah. has. Wants to but if you're good. Um, yeah, no, I, I would really say um, if, if, you know, what I always tell people in school is you don't have to start a startup while you're in school. What I would say is use school to uh, learn just like the skills that you want to build out and to, to build stuff for the sake of building and, and do what uh, most interests you, like find that passion. And then also, you you know, you never are surrounded again by as many smart, hardworking people as you are in school. You probably won't be. So, so spend that time finding people you like to work with, you like to build things yes. with. Yes. Yeah, and start working on side projects. Yeah. That's beautiful. So what I was hearing was a mix of investing in your technical knowledge, um, investing in your self mastery. And what I really liked what Steph also said was follow your intellectual joy, right? And just putting those two words together, intellectual joy, right? And having that sense of, of the love of learning, I think. Um, just even with the companies we work with, when our interns ask us certain things, especially in the live streaming space in the Philippines, I have to tell them, I'm like, hey. So like, what's the best practice? You're like, haha, you can figure it out, good luck. Like, haha, I'll answer you in two more years. Because <laughs> sometimes you want to tell people like, hey, this is happening as we speak, it's in front of our eyes. And the best thing we can do is just be curious and keep learning and researching and, you know, Google it. Right? Sometimes I tell them, I'm like, um, some of these things happen so quickly, like even for ourselves. And these are people who are executives in the company. I said, we still have to learn. We're not going to stop learning because even how it's happening now, we're witnessing it. So um, I love what you said with just always um, with, Steph, with Steph, you always said going back to that you know, intellectual joy or cat, you said, have the hobbies you're passionate about, just fueling that curiosity as your energy source so that you never get burnt out while you're in this industry. So I love, I love your answers. Um, so it's already, it's already been an hour. So I'm going to be wrapping up um, this conversation in a bit. Um, when it comes to, for example, your um, definition of success, what do you feel are the benchmarks of it in your careers or, or lives? Wow, what a question. <laughs> uh, we can start with Kat. <laughs> I think it changes uh, as, as you get older, as you experience more things. Like right now, you know, uh, working at YC for seven years, I've gotten to work with a lot of like incredible founders. And it's like, and I think right now I'm trying to, I, I think about the impact that I want to have. And like, what is, what is the most, um, you know, positive impact I can, can I have in the world? Um, and like you said, you know, it might sound cheesy, but it's like, a, what, what change do you want to make in the world? Like what positive change and like, what's the highest leverage thing I can do? Um, to make that change happen. And so I think I think about that um, as like, you know, 
at a certain point you you make enough money that you're monetarily comfortable you you know you have a title which you know people are impressed with whatever you don't need any of that stuff anymore and then you start thinking about like what is the what is the long term impact and so you know i think that's what i've been trying to think of you know now like when when you know what comes next for me it's like it'll it'll have that as that and i think people um like who do i want to spend my time working with for the next 10 years um, you know, kind of that, that's how I, I sort of think about what I want to do and, and how I want to spend my time. Beautiful. That makes so much sense. Um, I, 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 uh, I resonates with me too, right? It changes, uh, it changes with time. It's changed uh, with time for me. I think earlier in my career, I, um, for me, success was, um, um, building um, really great tools and earning like respect for my community um, by building these tools. Um, as I've um, become um, a founder, uh, well, as um, the first three years of Thinking Machines, the definition of success was just not dying. In my mind, I'm like, you know what? If I can just not die for long enough, I think I can, <laughs> or think we will be able to find success. Um, and, and five years in, um, we're very comfortably like default alive, doing really well. Now I get to think about um, our long term. And I think now for me, the definition of success will be uh, in terms of um, impact, right? All, again, like I guess like, it all comes down to that in the end. Um, um, can I build a really great institution? Uh, can I build a really great institution that uh, even when I'm not directly um, talking to people or motivating people, like they, uh, they feel me in the system that I have built and uh, they benefit from that, they grow from that. Uh, will our um, 20 years from now, uh, will the data landscape in the Philippines be a better place because of um, because of thinking machines because of me? Um, that's um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, uh, the definition I have for myself at this point. Beautiful answers. Um, when it comes to the Philippine startup scene, there's a lot of companies that admire what you two have done and just you know they just want to be in that space, right? Um, what is your advice for the Philippine? startups that want to make it globally or do business overseas as well? Staff, I'll let you take that one first. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's an interesting, uh, the timing of that question is really interesting because um, we opened the Singapore branch office of Philippines uh, almost uh, two, two years ago now, and we're opening our Thailand Bangkok branch office in Q1 wow. um, next year. And so we have done, um, I noticed that there are a lot of uh, startups that uh, come to the Philippines from elsewhere in the region, uh, but there did not seem to be that many that go that go outward. And I've been, I've been wondering about that. Um, one thing I have observed is um, there's sometimes like a bit of a defeatist mentality uh, among startup founders I talk to who are moving abroad. Um, a lot of them will, um, and, and this is not data, right? This is anic data. This is not like real data. This is like four stories. Um, so I have, um, I had um, some friends who, um, because they saw a much bigger market for their um, uh, loyalty payments app in, I think, Malaysia, just straight up like move there, right? They stopped operating in the Philippines and like, they moved there. Um, I know another startup founder, um, this woman who um, had a fantastic career in FMCG and then started a FMCG uh, tech analytics and, and marketing optimization startup. And she straight up just moved to Singapore. Like she was raising, I don't remember the exact chain of events, uh, but she um, she had started her career here. Procter & Gamble moved her to Singapore. She met her co-founder there. They started the co company there, um, tried to do some work in the Philippine market, gave up like, but, and focused to, and I, I don't want to say gave up, but they chose to focus on uh, the much more active like Singaporean market and like grow there. Um, if you're looking for uh, the kind of return window um, that um, venture capitalists need, um, you have to make tough decisions about where to focus your time, attention, and energy. And I'm just noticing that unless you're in the fintech space, uh, unless you're in fintech or like you know, cool move in the in the, like the streaming, uh, more entertainment space, there doesn't seem to be a big enough market for what a lot of people want to do uh, in the Philippines. Which uh, I 
you know, I don't like giving like rara advice. Like it's it's really about like confronting, like really, really observing, listening. What is the situation you're in? What is the best decision you can make, uh, given all the factors around you? Um, if you are somebody starting a company in the Philippines, it might genuinely make sense for you to look at your industry and decide, uh, I want to start this company in Singapore, uh, raise funding there, grow there, the market's more ready for us there, and then come back to the Philippines in five years time when it's ready. Or you might tell yourself, I'm in it for the long haul here in the Philippines. I'll bootstrap it. I'll raise money from people who like, understand that it's going to take uh, 10 years to see anything back, not like the seven-year venture window, um, and grow here. Um, you just have to make um, so just, you have to make um, um, really difficult decisions. And uh, for me personally, it's coming from a place of like mild shock that uh, our business in Singapore grew so much faster than our business in the Philippines. Uh, organizations there are so much more ready uh, for data technologies. They argue with us a lot less about uh, the need to deploy, deploy on-premise. Like we're like, no, like a decision I've made is like, uh, you have to build cloud first. Like we're not gonna accommodate clients who want to build uh, on-premise data tech because we think that that's kind of backwards at this point. Um, sorry, I, I kind of, <laughs> I think I lost the thread of the question um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, Sorry, I totally did. I totally did like lose lose the thread of the question. I've just been. I just thought of all these examples of people I know who. Uh, it's just so hard to start a business in the region and grow a Filipino company outside because the Philippines is such a unique mess. It's such a unique mess. succeeding here does not help you succeed anywhere else. Yeah. So. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying, though, and but what um, one you know, sort of positive trend I've seen in other countries is that, you know, the fintech layer will be built first, right? So we've seen this in a lot of, you know, uh, Southeast Asian, you know, even even in India where you have that fintech layer and a company, companies like Paymongo will help lay the groundwork for more companies to be built on top of them and more e-commerce, more of, of everything. And so um, I'm hoping it's moving in the right direction there where you know maybe not immediately but within the next five ten years the philippines does emerge um, because there's such a i mean it's a, it's a young country it's a country with a lot of people there are, there should be there's a lot of opportunity still left yeah absolutely and i think just um just observing this space um seeing the success stories that you two are are doing it provides a lot of inspiration for those um, about to walk that path, right? And I think that's the thing. Just also hearing, I know Steph, you're saying I'm saying a lot of stories, but that's what we need, right? We need to know these stories because sometimes we didn't even know this existed, right? Especially in the Philippines, like um, sometimes you know we we don't know that these stories are happening or is being told, and we just need exposure to it and awareness that, you know, hey, this also happened, also study this, um, hear this, watch this, right? Um, and I think that this conversation is super valuable for for those who will, who will watch this. <laughs> okay, um, moving on to our last question uh, for the two of you, what do you feel you'll be doing in the next five to 10 years? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Did anybody call 2020 five years ago? No. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know what I'd be doing three years ago. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'd be doing last week. <laughs> but if you, if you could imagine in the realm of possibilities, um, what do you feel? Do you feel that it would still be in the world of tech? Um, I know our title of this panel panel is called, you know, Pinai Tech Heroes. Um, is there anything else you'd like to explore? Pet heroes, just kidding. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I like tech. I think um, I might, I don't know, it's within the realm of possibility of me taking a break from, um, wow. You know, I, I, uh, I, I Dude, I think I'm, I'm still, I really love this job. I think I'm going to be in it. I was just looking at um, other um, similar companies um, um, just yesterday, looking to see what thinking machines might look like 10 years from now. 
And I remember being totally wowed by this one startup uh, where the CEO, um, gosh, I'm totally blanking on their name right now. I have it, I have it written down somewhere. Um, but this dude started this, uh, a consulting a technology company in like 1989. And he, he, he built, um, and, and the company today is, uh, is a publicly traded uh, data analytics like platform uh, company, and I just looked, and he's still he's still the CEO. He's been the CEO, founder and CEO of this company for as long as I've been alive. And I was like, hashtag goals. <laughs> <laughs> the sustainable passion there, <laughs> right? Right. Um, yeah, like I I think that I'm definitely going to be somehow um, still in that space. Of course, things will. I mean, it's gosh, like it's so hard to stay the next stages of life, right? Like uh, uh, having 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 kids, or or with climate change, maybe becoming like something um, um, that desperately needs to be worked on, like directly. Uh, there's so many things that could happen, but uh, man, that is a hard question. I don't even ask that question anymore when I when I interview people because everybody's like. <laughs> <laughs> the emoji. The emoji. Yeah, the emoji. <laughs> it's like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how the rest of 2020 goes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you know what, Roz? How about we uh, we wait till next week, and then we'll see where we are next week, and then if we still have an answer, then <laughs> we'll answer this question next year in another panel discussion. <laughs> Um, but how about you, Kat, if you could think in the realm of possibilities, well, even yeah. if it is a dream? I think it's hard because, yeah, every, every things change so fast, as we all know now this year. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seven months pregnant. So I, first of all, first of all, I'll have a baby. Thank you. Um, but I definitely, you know, YC is so interesting because one of my favorite parts of the job is we read applications. We get 15,000 applications every six months and we get to see what some of the smartest, most ambitious people in the world are thinking about. And so, I, you know, I do love the job and like I've been doing it for seven years, could see myself doing it longer. But also I think when you're surrounded by so many entrepreneurial people, you're like, I want to do this too. And I think most of the partners at YC are entrepreneurial people and, and like always have it in the back of their mind, like maybe I should just start something now. Um, and I think the big question is like, what do I want to spend the next 10, 20 years of my life? Like, what is that sustainable passion? What do you know, what do I want to be doing in the next 20 years? Um, and I, I've thought about it, like the, what are the big problems that I think need to be solved, whether that's climate change or remote learning. And I, I think there's so many interesting spaces. So I have not narrowed anything down yet, but I think there's there's a lot of opportunity. And I, and I, and I do love tech. And I see um, that, you know, tech has the ability to do so much good, so like all around the world. And the thing, the coolest thing to me is at YC, when I first started, we didn't fund any international companies. Um, our first international company we funded in, in you know, uh, 2014, uh, and it was an Indian company. And it was just sort of an experiment to see like, can we actually help international companies? And now 40% of the companies we fund are international. And so I'm, I like, I love being part of that. And so maybe there's even something that I can do like, you know, internationally that, that would be exciting. That's so beautiful. Can do it in the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it. yeah. It's more fun in the Philippines. That's here. That's right here. <laughs> yeah, I think especially in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, um, just um, seeing how the market and the industry is developing so fast, it's just so exciting to watch. And I think um, what you said, Kat, resonates with a lot of people with um, – I just want to be part of that. <laughs> That's so cool. It's so exciting. And going back to the words, you know, joy or passion. And I know a lot of talks say that, but I kind of want to tell people like, no, that's real. Like you can't measure that sometimes. Like you feel it. And um, I, I love hearing these stories from you too. I've felt that passion. I heard it just how you talk about your careers and your lessons. I am so inspired. Um, in the next panel, I'd like to watch and I'll moderate it next time. <laughs> but um, It was just so valuable with the lesson. So I'm just so grateful that you spent the last hour and I, I think 15 minutes here with us. And um, that pretty much wraps up our panel discussion for today. It is the Pinay Tech Shiros from the lens of Filipina tech leaders. Again, 
Thank you so much. It's so inspiring watching women and also watching Kunai women. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today here, Steph and Kat. And to those who are watching, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that you learned something valuable. I know I have. Have a nice day. And that ends our Startup Pinay program. We hope that these panel discussions not only raised awareness about women-led startups in the country, but empowered you guys as well. If you're a female founder who hasn't signed up yet for Startup Pinay, we hope that you can fill out this form so we can add you to the mailing list for our future programs as well as resources and opportunities that we can share with you. Thank you again to everyone who stayed until the end of this program. So remember, this is only the beginning for Penice in Tech, so we'll see you all soon. Thank you. What makes a successful and resilient company? A company that is innovative, has dynamic, productive teams, and high employee engagement. A company where people stay. How? Workplace gender equality is key to achieving these goals. Workplace gender equality is when every member of the workplace has equal access to resources, opportunities, and benefits to thrive and progress at all levels. Companies committed to workplace gender equality hold themselves accountable. They make sure that policies and practices are in place to eliminate both direct and indirect discrimination and work hard to build an inclusive work culture. I think the biggest challenge, if you don't realize there is an issue, you will never going to fix it. So that's why we think that our job is to increase the level of awareness through showing statistics that actually there are still inequalities when it comes to gender. Companies that prioritize workplace gender equality perform better financially. According to a 2019 report from the International Labor Organization, globally, 74% of firms that tracked the impact of gender diversity in management reported profit increases ranging from 5 to 20%. On the practical side, even look at the market, I think NIMA is changing, technology, you know, all these things are changing. I think just having different voices, not just gender, um, it's just inclusive enough in terms of age, you know, gender, everything. People recognize that it's time for them to hear different voices at the board level in management. Companies are only as good as their people. Retaining the best talent, in good times and bad, is critical. A company loses money when it loses talent. Studies show that replacing an employee costs more than 25% of a person's annual income. Policies and practices that promote workplace gender equality can help prevent good employees from leaving. I think the reason why the company is looking through this opportunity is basically to look through into the future more to see sustainability by giving equal opportunity to everyone. Large and influential companies have come together to form business coalitions in Indonesia, Myanmar, the Philippines and Vietnam. The business coalitions have proven to be trusted advisors and centers of excellence. They work with diverse firms to improve their bottom line, increase employee retention and engagement, and build reputations in the region. There's always a value to, as they say, working together harnessing individual strengths, resources to a common advocacy. Workplace gender equality supports your most important asset, the people you work with, attracts and retains the best talent, enhances your company's reputation, and improves productivity and profits. Contact the Business Coalition in your country to learn more. environment where women not only feel safe and welcomed but also are able to thrive I think is really a great step in enabling them to maximize their full potential. As a woman the last thing I ever wanted to be was a man. I always felt I had a lot of opportunities that men don't have. My grandmother, as far as women were concerned, she always felt that you know, they really were very, very productive and drove productivity as a whole. We as Accenture has always believed that inclusion and diversity is a major source and a powerful multiplier of innovation. So gender equality for me is for women to have the opportunity 
to become productive members of society and be recognized accordingly. It means to me that women can realize their full potential. I've always been very particular about using a gender equality. More than a quantity, uh, I think, it is about diversity. It is one way of creating a community, a community that is aware that there is such a thing as unconscious gender bias, but uh, really it is to be able to learn from one another and uh, be part of a community that supports gender empowerment because you feel stronger when you're part of a community. Well, gender equality, it is a healthy balance between the men and the women in a workforce where people are hired for their qualifications, for their preparation, for their training, and not just for their biology. It is important because it is part of uh, correct management. It is part of sensitivity. Today, half of our 122 partners are women. We believe that by joining PBCV, we become part of a coalition that shares our overall purpose of creating a better working world where everyone is treated equally. PNB joined PBC We because we want to give equal opportunity to everyone regardless of gender. This coalition that has a clear purpose, it has a clear mandate. We joined PBC We because we felt it was time to take a bigger stand. SGV was more than happy to be a founding member of the Philippine Business Coalition for Women Empowerment because the firm has always been a strong advocate of advancing women's initiatives. We wanted to use our space to advance women empowerment, promote gender equality, and educate others on the important role that women play in the workforce. At Yellow Land, we provide the ideal setting for our workforce to find opportunities for growth, unimpeded by my gender, color, shape, or form, in a way that brings out my value as an individual so that I can contribute value to the greater organization. We feel that more and more organizations should become part of this group and they will find it in fact worthwhile. Joining the Philippine Business Coalition for Women Empowerment will provide companies with opportunities to network and work with other institutions to share the same vision and values and workforce equality. We thought that it was important for us to be part of a coalition that supports women empowerment in the workplace. For us to be able to benchmark, baseline, learn from, and of course, help others. Being a member of PBC We, we will be able to do more in terms of gender equality, and not just gender, but diversity in the workplace. Any company that's part of BBC We is in effect saying, I am an amazingly innovative, creative, culturally sensitive company. And in today's world, you must be that. PBC We provides a space for them to be heard and share best practices on how we can drive gender balance in the organization.